Captain, the transporter chief mentioned a surge of power. The transporter rock might have been affected by the ion storm, and we just materialized somewhere else. Yes, here. Not our universe, not our ship. Something parallel. Bridge to all decks. Time for a brand new episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm the evil version of Steve Morris because <laughs> we have traveled to the mirror podcast world. And I can't tell you how excited I am about this episode. This is very, very, very exciting for, for quite a few reasons. We are up to the point of Enterprise Incidents where we are doing one of the very best episodes of Star Trek ever produced. And like you said... At the top, mister, it is Mirror, Mirror, an episode that I have always, always, always loved, and an episode that watching it this time with this set of eyes that we've been doing Enterprise Incidents uh, covering the original series, it was such a joy, an absolute joy to rewatch this episode and really, really get into it. But the question I have for you, Steve, is do you remember, I mean, I know you don't remember like specifically like, like I do, but... Maybe this one you remember because it is such a unique I'm never going to remember when I saw it the first time. <laughs> I have no memory of any Star Trek episode when I saw it the first time. But I do have memory of coming home from school, turning it on, and seeing the Enterprise switch directions and going, oh, it's going to be mirror, mirror. And was always so excited. And, you know, we've talked about how our image of certain episodes have changed as we've watched it with a very close eye for the show. Sure. I texted you last night as I was watching this and wrote, I believe I used some foul language about how good I think this episode is. And I also know, by the way, that you have a very special connection to this particular episode of Star Trek. Well, well, there there are quite a few special connections to this episode of Star Trek, starting with the fact, Steve, that this podcast episode of Enterprise Incidents covering Mirror Mirror means that we are at the halfway point in our journey through the original series. Because if you include the cage, that means there are 80 episodes of the original series. And by going in production order, Mirror Mirror is number 40. So we are right in the middle. And I would say that that maybe with one or two episodes that are coming up, one of them being Trouble with Tribbles, that with the exception of Trouble with Tribbles, which is obviously a more lighthearted episode, I would say, and correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but that Mirror Mirror represents like the last of the true super top, top tier episodes of the original series. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't have a perfect catalog in my head, but I can't think of anything that tops it. I, I really can't. I mean, I, I love Trouble with Tribbles, and there are certainly other episodes of season two that I love, and there are certainly episodes of season three that I do love, and I think season three is underrated, but clearly not as good as the first two. But in terms of like sitting on the edge of forever, you know, Doomsday Machine, a yeah. mock time where no man has gone before, balance of terror, obviously, at least for me, metamorphosis, uh, Mirror Mirror is like the top, top, top of the top. Yeah. of the great, great, great Star Trek episodes ever produced, not just of the original show, but of all time. And like you said, Steve, I have a very, very special memory because I do remember I seeing this episode for the first time because it is Mirror Mirror that is the very first episode of Star Trek that I ever saw. I remember growing up in Philadelphia, I was I I had just turned six years old. I remember because it was around it was around the uh, uh, Thanksgiving holiday, and I was playing wiffle ball. Remember wiffle ball uh, with my friends. Uh, it was Mitchell Paul, Brett Goldberg, and Alan Summer, and Michael Keeney on Nandina Place, and it was seven o'clock at night. And Mitch, Mitch Paul, he's holding the wiffle ball bat. He goes, Star Trek is on, and he throws the bat down. <laughs> he, he runs inside. He runs in his basement. And we're all looking at each other like, what the heck just happened? Where'd he go? So so they wanted to keep playing. I went inside. Okay, now, now I see him. He's already in front of the TV. And the episode is underway. 
so the first image, the first image in the first episode that I ever saw was the landing party beaming up to the Enterprise and the lightning and the thunder going on while they're beaming up to the Enterprise. And, and I remember seeing Spock and this guy in a red shirt who I later learned was, was Kyle. Uh, they're trying to beam them aboard and it phases out. And then you see the Enterprise going from left to right. And then there's the flash, and the Enterprise is going from right to left. They beam aboard the Enterprise in these different outfits, and Spock has a Van Dyke beard. And that was my introduction to Star Trek. And the irony is that this is the episode that lit my fuse for Star Trek, but it is an atypical episode of Star Trek. But that's the one that did it. Isn't that amazing? What, what so? Because you've told me this story before, of course, and, and now in my mind, it has gained such importance. It has become a epic moment of a mythic journey of your life. And I'm picturing like, you know, Excalibur coming out of the sword. I'm picturing, you know, there's the moment in the Charlie Chaplin movie with Robert Downey Jr. where he discovers the hat. Oh, yeah. You know, this is what I'm picturing. It's like, this is where Scott Mance discovered his life purpose in this moment. And, you know, it, that is an absolutely accurate statement because the way that this series, specifically the original series, much more than the other Star Trek shows, way, way much more, actually, uh, the way that this series has informed my life, the way that this series has inspired my life, the way that it has given me so much joy, specifically doing Enterprise Incidents with you, my friend, but also other things like working for the company that ran the crea uh, those right. conventions and, and just being involved with, with Star Trek over these years, meeting many of the actors and the, the writers and producers and being involved with, with uh, documentaries and, and books that I've been interviewed for and so on and so on. But it all started with that Charlie Chaplin magic moment yeah. of, of seeing Mirror Mirror for the first time. And what I always loved over these years, whenever Mirror Mirror was on, in the rotation, in syndication, and when I finally got it on my audio tape, holding up my tape recorder to the mm -hmm. TV, I was so excited. I was like, I got it. I got Mirror Mirror, and I, I learned the dialogue and the music cues uh, by heart by listening to it over and over again. But this really is one of Star Trek's very, very best episodes. It is perfect. I mean, you could say so much. It's so fun. It's imaginative. It's outside the box. It's influenced so much of the Star Trek that has followed. It has influenced pop culture. It has been spoofed yep. in uh, other shows and so on. But it really is perfect is the one word that really sums it up. Thanks to its, its superb acting, the writing, the directing, and of course, Jerry Finnerman's amazing cinematography, the production values, the costume design from uh, William Ware, Bill Tice, uh, the performances, and I know we're going to get into this uh, with regards to Leonard Nimoy, who once again knocks it out of the park. And this is, I would say, even more than the Doomsday Machine, a true acting ensemble. It's not just yep. about the three of them, 100%. right? Mm -hmm. And like, like, and Doomsday Machine was was also an ensemble, but Uhura was not in that episode, nor was Chekhov. They're both in this episode. Everyone is in this episode, and everyone has their moment to shine. I couldn't agree more, and I am really curious, how did this incredible episode of television come about? Well, uh, it's a very loaded question, but for starters, it was filmed between July 25th and August 2nd, 1967, with a half of a day pickup on August 11th. So I'll get into that uh, in a bit. So basically, it was seven and a half days, which means it went a day and a half over schedule. And as we talked about, uh, Mirror Mirror is the 40th episode to film, but it was the 33rd episode to air, which it did on October 6th, 1967. And even with the incredible production design, because this is largely a bottle show, even though they, they changed all the sets and definitely uh, changed the lighting and that the costume design was so great, there's so many extras, Mirror Mirror came in 
at $188,530, which means it only went over budget by about $3,530. The second season budget by this point was $185,000. And the episode was directed by Mark Daniels. Mark Daniels and Joseph Pevney, you know, it's, uh, trading right. uh, every other episode with Ralph Sinetsky jumping in as well. And the episode was written by Jerome Bixby. Now, Jerome Bixby, this is the first of four Star Trek episodes mm. that he wrote. The others being by any other name, Day of the Dove, which mm -hmm. is a great one, and Requiem for Methuselah, which I'm not, which I'm not too <laughs> crazy about. But Jer Jerome Bixby actually wrote a spec. Jerome Bixby actually wrote a spec script for Star Trek's first season that was never produced. Mm. The episode was called Mother Tiger, and in the episode, okay, see if this sounds familiar. The Enterprise encounters a sleeper ship. Mm. What does that sound like? Sounds like Space Seed. Sounds like Space Seed, but that's where it ends because from that point forward, uh, the uh, sleeper ship has an alien baby that grows at a very fast rate into a beautiful woman who is the sole survivor of her kind, which mm. kind of sounds a little like Devil in the Dark. Sure. Okay. Uh, but no, this is a woman, not a horde. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so Jerome Bixby wrote the episode, and uh, it was... Uh, it was his outline on February 27th, 1967, which got the ball rolling. But it is worth mentioning that back when Gene Roddenberry wrote his very first one-page pitch for Star Trek on March 11th, 1964, there was a synopsis for a story called The Mirror. Mm. So it was just a very quick you know, synopsis. It certainly didn't get into the kind of detail uh, that this episode certainly does. And he wrote uh, his outline based on Jerome Bixby's outline on April 1st. Jerome Bixby did a second draft teleplay on June of 1967. Dorothy Fontana did a script polish in July of 1967. And then Gene Kuhn did his script polish, a final draft teleplay on July 17th. Now, one of the things about Mirror Mirror that I'm sure everybody loves is the music. Now, the music sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's a lot of music I've heard before, yes. It's a lot of music you've heard before. Now, uh, a lot of that music comes from Balance of Terror. Mm. But instead of reusing the music from Balance of Terror, composer Fred Steiner repurposed it re-recorded it mm. on September 8th, 1967, which was the one-year anniversary of when Star Trek premiered on mm. NBC. So, but when you hear Fred Steiner's score, especially the, the, the theme of Mirror Mirror, it's basically the same theme that the Romulans had mm. in Balance of Terror. Well, that's interesting. But if you're like me, and I think you are in this case, when you hear that music, what do you think of first, Balance of Terror or Mirror Mirror? Probably Mirror Mirror. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Um, I mean, it's they're fam they're both two of my all time favorite episodes, um, and it feels like maybe was there a cue from the Doomsday Machine in there too? I feel like there might have been. Yeah, there was towards <clears> the <throat> end. Yeah, there was towards the end. Um, what's interesting to me is that this is so much a this is a science fiction idea. That's this clearly starts with a sci fi idea. This is parallel universes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The crew of the Enterprise goes to a parallel universe, and then we explore that idea. And this is a thing that is classically Star Trek that we haven't talked about that much in a while. But so there's so many episodes where you go like, okay, we encounter a god. Someone frozen from the past comes back to life. We're on a planet where everything we think of comes true. These are science fiction ideas that you then build a story on to explore. And I think that that approach is part of the key the key genetics, the, the the magical DNA of Star Trek is part of what we're doing, not all of what we're doing, is to explore ideas. Oh, well, well they definitely picked the right person to explore these ideas because in addition to, to writing four Star Trek episodes, Jerome Bixby actually based this episode on his own short story called One Way Street, which appeared in a magazine called Amazing Stories. Oh, sure. So, but Jerome Bixby actually was one of the writers of Fantastic Voyage oh. from 1966. So he also wrote the film It, The Terror from Beyond Space, 
And on TV, he wrote the classic Twilight Zone episode, It's a Good Life. Oh, that's... Yeah, yeah. starring Bill Mummy, who yeah. from uh, Lost in Space. That's our that's and our Charlie X episode that, of, Star, of that, Twilight Zone. That's absolutely, yeah. absolutely is what it is. And Mirror Mirror was nominated for a Hugo Award for 1968, where, it, of course, it lost to The City on the right. Edge of Forever. Um, would you like to know some of the things going on in the world while they were filming this episode of, of television? Of course. So uh, on July 25th, it's the midst of the Cultural Revolution in China. And on this day, they began a series of arrests purging the Chinese military of 80,000 people that they believed were not, quote unquote, loyal or communist enough for Chairman Mao. Over the next two years, 1,169 of them were executed. And many of the rest died either through starvation, torture, or oh wow or mm. just yeah awful yeah absolutely terrible uh, on the same day pope paul the 6th became the first pope to visit istanbul or constantinople in more than 12 centuries because that's the classic split between the eastern orthodox or greek orthodox church and the roman church you know but there was that what there was these were the two key cities of christianity constantinople and rome and 1,200 years since a pope had visited it. Amazing. Mm. On the same day, another miracle, Matt LeBlanc was born. <laughs> uh, how you doing? <laughs> and on the next day, Jason Statham was born. <laughs> on July 28th, the Milford Act was signed by the governor of California. And this is one of the strictest uh, means of gun control ever created in the United States. They, they created a five-year jail term for any person caught carrying a loaded gun on a public street street in the state of California. And do you know what governor signed this into law? Who? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, because, governor of California. Governor of California, because at the time, gun control was a Republican issue. Uh -huh. Oh, no way. Yeah, you want to know why? What was the motivation for signing this very strict gun control law? And what was it? The Black Panthers. Oh. Because they were openly carrying weapons, and conservatives saw them as a threat to the police and a threat to order, and so they said, we, you can't let people carry guns that are loaded. And the only reason I point this out is to just to say, like, we think that our politics are locked in place, but they're not. Mm, we, that's we, true. If you look at a Republican from 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or a Democrat, same, that we have changed and changed and changed oh, over the that's years. That's really interesting. On July 29th, there was an explosion on an aircraft carrier, U.S. aircraft carrier, that killed 134 sailors. And this sounds really scary. They were, they were refueling and arming aircrafts for an attack on North Vietnam when the fire broke out, uh, and that led to an explosion. And one of the pilots who was in an A-4 on the deck of the aircraft carrier at the time was John McCain. John McCain, And he wow. was struck by a rocket, hit by shrapnel, uh, burned, and yet still helped with all the rescue efforts. And he later became a POW. Yep. Wow, he really went through the ringer there, didn't he? He's a true hero. Unbelievable. You know, yeah, regardless really of what is. you think about him later in life as a, a political figure, the guy's a hero. He definitely is. This one's really interesting. Have you ever heard of the Bohemian Grove Men's Club? No. Okay, I've heard about this before, and it is one of the weirdest things. It is a strange secret society of extremely wealthy uh, conservative people who meet in the woods in Marin County, which is where I grew up, mm -hmm. where they have secret camps that are actually guarded by uh, by ex-military that still exist. They're people like Herbert Hoover and Robert Oppenheimer, and they uh, it would go, and it's like a camping trip. And nobody knows what they do there, <laughs> except that extremely powerful people go through this place. And on this date, July 29th, 1967, Richard Nixon visited the Bohemian Grove, made a speech, and most people point to this moment as what led to his run for president in 1968. Oh, is that right. Yeah. Wow. This is a really powerful, you know, like if you think about like, the you know the Simpsons episode where there's like the the powerful cabal of th this is wh what it is and who knows you know like along with the the Yale Key and whatever that club is like there are these enclaves of wealthy people that maybe are deciding everything that goes on in our <laughs> world Scott I don't <laughs> yeah, know yeah. Um, uh, this one's tragic on August eighth uh, nine Japanese high school students were killed by a bolt of lightning while descending Mount Nishidoaka. 
uh, and 10 others were injured. Can you imagine? Like, they're just on, like, a school field trip, and they get hit by a bolt of lightning, nine killed, 10 injured. Unbelievable. Absolutely wow. scary. Would you like? I know you would. Are you ready? I'm so ready. In fact, what I would like to do with our deep dive in this episode, Steve, is remember when we were doing our deep dive of City on the Edge of Forever? Yes. There were so many differences mm. between the version that aired and the earlier versions, the outlines, the earlier teleplays, that at the end of each act, I went through and I just sort of said, like, what what would have been different? I, I love it. I can't wait. Okay, this well, great. I'm going to do that for, for, for the teaser, even the teaser. That things were different, and and wait till you hear some of these differences as we go through act by act. Cannot wait. We start literally with a bang. We're on this platform. There's thunder. There's lightning. We have no idea what's going on. I love. You know, we talked about this idea of enter late. This is a perfect example. We're right in the middle of something. On this platform, we see Kirk, McCoy, Scotty, and Uhura, and they're meeting with the Hulkin Council. And we hear... We believe what you say, Captain Kirk, but our position has not altered. The Halcon Council cannot permit your Federation to mine dilithium crystals on our planet. What I love about this beginning is that it does not show the Enterprise in orbit. It doesn't show the landing party beaming down to meet the Halcon Council. Like you said, it's great that they're they're already in the middle of something mm -hmm. here. They're already in the middle of this conversation. The, the dramatic way it begins with the camera zooming in and Kirk and the landing party, they're all looking up at the lightning and the thunder where the Halkins, the Halkin cancel, they're not. The, right. It is the Federation. Uh, uh, our, our heroes are the ones that are, are taking in that this, this lightning and this thunder is going on and this, this gorgeous set. Uh, on stage 10 mm -hmm. and the purple sky in the background. And, you know, Kirk is wearing the green wraparound shirt. I love that shirt. Absolutely. Uh, but, but here's so, so this is the thing. So what, what exactly is the Federation negotiating with the Halkins? Uh, they are negotiating mining rights to mine some dilithium crystals. Okay. Right. So, so there's something very different here between the, the demeanor in which Kirk tries to reason with the Halkin. Uh, leader whose name is Tharn. Okay. Uh, Tharn is played by Vic Perrin. Mm. And if his voice sounds familiar, well, you just heard him as Nomad <laughs> in The Changeling. And you also heard him as the voice of the Metron in Arena. But now we get to see Vic Perrin and the character's name is Tharn. And there's a there's a deeper story that that uh, goes back to the earlier versions of the screenplay. But anyway, so... By, by the way, I would never have recognized his voice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, because you see his face and you're not thinking, like, where have I heard the voice before? Well, well and also the I am nomad. Like, that's Well, that's not, true. That yeah. doesn't sound like the way this... The guy's very soft in the way that he talks. He's very, very peaceful gentle, sounding. Very peaceful, yeah. But but notice the, 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 the how different the demeanor is between the way Kirk is trying to reason with the Hawkins and the way he tried to reason... With the Capellans in Friday's Child, mm. you know he was trying to get uh, a mineral there that was going to save lives on other planets. Whereas now he's he's looking to open a treaty for mining rights to dilithium and crystals. So the dilithium represents awesome power, as Tharn says, mm -hmm. and he's concerned that all you have to do is fire your ship's phasers once to take one life, and you will violate our history of total peace. That is how devoted they are to their to to peace that they're not they're not even well for that for the time being they are they're saying that you know we, we can't take that chance we'll die as a race if we have to rather than take one life through you're using our crystals in, in, as a show of force so it's interesting so you bring up friday's child you know the episode this makes me think of uh I'll let me guess go ahead errand of mercy errand of mercy okay why because it is literally Kirk coming and finding a very peaceful group of people who he's trying to convince of his goodwill and the peaceful intentions of the Federation. And they're going, we cannot be a part of anything that's to do with violence. And the difference is, and this is why I really, again, it's these variations on a theme. What I love is that that society secretly was super powerful. They were never in danger. Right, right. This but society, we didn't know that. But we didn't know that. And right. Kirk didn't know that. This society has basically exactly the same stance, except they are going to die. 
Like they are willing yeah. to lay down their lives mm -hmm. for their principles. Very, very interesting that you and I both picked up on yeah. different diplomatic tactics that Kirk had displayed before. And, and you pick one episode and I pick the other. <laughs> well, and it's interesting, too, that in, a, in an episode that's going to be about the use of force and power and different approaches to it, we start off with the most black and white, any kind of violence. We would rather die as a race. That is an incredible, incredible line. I admire your ethics and hope to prove ours. And then there is this flash of lightning and thunder. Kirk calls up to the Enterprise. Kirk to Enterprise. Spock here. Report on magnetic storm, Mr. Spock. Standard ion type, Captain, but quite violent and unpredictable. They're having a rough ride. Yeah. When may we resume discussion? The Council will meditate further, but do not be hopeful of any change. And as Kirk turns away to leave, Tharn says to Captain Kirk, Captain, you do have the might to force the crystals from us, of course. And Kirk looks back at him with a smile, and he says, But we won't. Consider that. I think that's a great moment. And it is, and again, it's very much what happens in Aaron of Mercy, and it is very much saying this is what the Federation believes in. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so Kirk calls up to the Enterprise, and this is my moment. This is the moment. Yep. Going back to six-year-old little Scott Nance. Enterprise. Transporter room, energize. And this is what I love. I love while the landing party is beaming up. There is the lightning, like right at that moment. You see the lightning and you hear the thunder and you're in the transporter room with Kyle and with Spock. And Kyle says right away, he says, Troublesome. And Spock motions to like help him. And you see the landing party, you see them beaming through, right? But then they, they never quite get there and they beam back out and the look of concern on Spock's face. Mm -hmm. So then you have this great shot. And I, I love this. I love this scene. I love the scene so much that it's, it's one of the few scenes where I actually prefer the original visual effects over the remastered, redone visual mm. effects. When you see the Enterprise go from left to right, and then that flash, and then, you know, for a split second, it's like going both ways. And then it settles on the Enterprise going from right to left. Now, when you see the Enterprise going from right to left, what do you notice about that version of the Enterprise, Steve? Nothing. Tell me what okay. I should have I noticed. I will tell you. <laughs> First of all, the nacelles, the warp nacelles, are not the lit nacelles. They're mm. the pointed nacelles. Mm. And the reason for that is because that scene was shot during the filming of the second pilot episode where no man has gone before. Oh. And the Enterprise looked different right. when, you know, they made further modifications when Star Trek went to series and they put the lit cells on, they put the lights on in the back. Um, they made the sensor array in the in the secondary hole a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. and they made the bridge a little bit smaller. But so what they did was the eleven foot model of the Enterprise uh, had to be shot on the uh, starboard side. That's where it had the decals, right. and that's where it had the uh, the lighting, because the port side is where all the wires went through. Right. So they couldn't shoot it from the port side. So what they did. In order to get an effect back in 1965, filming where no man has gone before, of a shot of the Enterprise going from right to left for a change, was mm -hmm. they took off the decals that said NCC 1701, mm. and they reversed them. So when they filmed the Enterprise going from left to right, right. and reversed it going from right to left, it said NCC 1701. Right. So that shot took about two years to finally make it into an episode. And that shot that they filmed in 65 is the version that you see when the Enterprise moves from right to left over the Halkin plant. So wait, in, this, in 65, they wanted a reverse shot, and so they filmed a reverse shot then. Right, correct. What they did was, like, you know, they, they knew that they were filming everything of the Enterprise going from left to right, and they, they wanted to switch it up. Let's get a couple shots of the Enterprise going from right to left for a change. So they filmed this version of the Enterprise moving from right to left, and they, they just reversed the decals uh, so that when they, when they reversed the, the, the negative, 
It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you do an optical and you flip it. That's yeah. That, that's. That, but what's interesting to me is that they they n then had a useless right to left enterprise because they then changed the design. Exactly. And so what this is again, it's the, my love of cheapness. Is they went. Oh wait a minute! We have a right to left enterprise, Correct. and it looks slightly different, but that's actually a good thing, and we can use it in this episode. And here's the other really good thing about it, Steve. So where the visual effects for the remastered versions of the original series, the ones that were done by Dave Rossi and Mike Akuda and Dini Sakuda, is that every single time we're in the mirror universe and you see the Enterprise orbiting the Halcon planet, you see it. You see it orbiting from right to left. Yeah. And when you see the Enterprise orbiting the Halcon planet from right to left, the version of the Enterprise that you see is the version from the second pilot mm. with the pointed in cells. That is so what, what, what I took this to indicate, and I thought, again, this is why these, uh, th this trio of producers were the right people to do the redone special effects, is that the version of the Enterprise that we see in the mirror universe is less advanced than the mm. version of the Enterprise that we see in the Prime Universe. Interesting. In fact, it is so far less advanced that when I get to tell you some of the differences in the earlier versions, it's going to make a whole lot more sense. But, but yes, so the, the whole point is while the, the, uh, the ISS Enterprise, the Imperial Starship Enterprise, is actually a little less advanced, and that is something that that the Akutas and Dave Rossi really ran with mm. when they redid the visual effects for this episode. Um, I feel like I should point out to those people listening, if you're hearing an odd noise, it is because it is pouring rain in Los <laughs> <Yeah>. Angeles. <laughs> and so that, if you're hearing a little bit of it, that's what's going on behind it. Hopefully that won't interfere with your enjoyment of this episode. But we have now reached a moment in Star Trek, a moment in Star Trek history, I believe, which is the they beam in to the Enterprise in the Mirror Universe. They, and everything in this moment is amazing. Everything in this moment is amazing. And by the way, all the subtle touches that they did when they were making this episode, because if you notice, the, the transporter effect in the Prime Universe, when they, when they sort of phase out in the Prime Universe, and then they, when they beam in to the Mirror Universe, the transporter effect looks different, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Well, that's because Van Der Veer photo effects created a different transporter effect for the mirror universe. So that's one detail. The other detail is that in the back of the transporter platform, you see the Earth with the sword through it. Mm -hmm. And you also notice that the lighting, the lighting throughout the Enterprise in the mirror universe is very, very different. And that's because... That's because you have Jerry Finnerman calling the shots with the lighting. And I love the moment where Kirk, because he doesn't know that anything's happened at first. And he's just kind of, yeah, Spock was right. It was a rough. And then he looks up. He gets the big imperial salute from the security guards. And then you see all the details. First one being, and most important maybe, is Spock with a beard, which is just, he looks so great. He looks so cool. I know there's a joke at the end where McCoy says, I might prefer him with a beard. It's like, I might too. He looks <laughs> awesome. He looks great. First of all, I would say that this is absolutely one of the one of the all time great teasers of of all of Star absolutely. Trek over over more than fifty five years. Because when the landing party is stepping off the platform, they don't even realize for a split second that their uniforms are different. Mm -hmm. And when Kirk sees Spock, and he sees Spock and Kyle salute that Imperial salute. And he sees Spock with the Van Dyke. It's actually a Van Dyke beard. And uh, it, the look on his face, he's absolutely in shock. And mm -hmm. he doesn't know what to say. And it's a good thing he says nothing. And Uhura has a moment where she starts to lean over to Scotty to say something. Mm -hmm. And he smartly kind of nods at her to be quiet. Right. There's just so many details. The uniform sorry, details, the fact that everybody is armed, that people have uh, daggers, they have knives is all really interesting. And you can see Kirk noticing all these things. This right. is Kirk the Observer. And I think this episode is one of the best examples of Kirk the Observer and the speed of his brain of figuring things out and making choices in real time. It's amazing throughout the entire episode. Shatner's performance. I know we're going to get into Nimoy's performance, which is like spectacular. But Shatner's performance is, is just as spectacular because he's... 
taking everything in. And like you said, Steve, he's also observing at the same time. His mind is racing, trying to catch up with where he is without giving without giving him and the landing party right. away. But I got to tell you, when I saw one of the things that, that scared me as a kid, the reason why I have such vivid memories of this episode was when, when Spock had the goatee, the, uh, the Van Dyke, I was, uh, I was pretty scared of him. Well, there's good reason to be scared of this guy, as <laughs> we're going to see later in the episode. Um, and I love the moment where Spock asks, Standard procedure, Captain. And he kind of looks around, and he nods, because what's he going to do, argue? He doesn't know what standard procedure is. And we hear, Sulu, you program phase a barrage on Hulkin cities. Yes, Mr. Spock. But you notice that even without even seeing Sulu, you can hear that Sulu is different. Yep. He's deeper he sounds more sinister. Yep. Um, and uh, and Spock asks Kirk about the military capabilities of the Hulkins, and he says softly, No. Regrettable that this society has chosen suicide. And then Spock turns his attention to Kyle. Mr. Kyle, you were instructed to compensate during the ion storm. But I tried, Mr. Spock, I tried. with the equipment cannot be tolerated. But Mr. Spock, Your I tried. Ionizer. And John Winston, this is probably the... the the best performance he gave. Yeah, in, I would say, yeah, probably. Yeah, in, in, in any episode of the original series. But he is he is terrified, terrified of Spock, already walking on eggshells. And Spock, in his cool, calm demeanor, says, Your agonizer, please. No, Mr. Spock! And he hands him a device, which it seems that basically all the crew of the Enterprise are carrying around with them a device that is designed solely to torture them. Right. Like, imagine walking around in the world literally carrying torture with you. And how often do you think torture is used with this crew? Like you said, uh, everyone on the crew, on the Mirror Universe crew, is carrying this device, the Agonizer. They're carrying around a dagger, and they are carrying around a phaser on board the Enterprise. Yeah. This is, I mean, like, this is a really, really scary ship, and Spock picks up this thing, and our landing party looks as he puts it on Kyle, who screams. He is screaming in absolute agony, hence the name, your agonizer. Your agonizer. But talk about a device that lived up to its name. And Uhura is uh, looking to turn away. Scotty is embracing her. And McCoy is horrified. Kirk is absolutely startled. Like, what? It, like, it is just fantastic. I don't care how many times you have seen Mirror Mirror, and I'm sure like Steve, like 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 me, that most of you will count it in the couple hundreds of times that you've seen Mirror Mirror. And this is an episode that always is great, always is fun, is always so startling. Uh, at this moment in particular. I couldn't agree more. I think this teaser is amazing. And the last look of Kirk as the teaser ends, as Kyle, you know, drops in pain from his torture. You've used the term several times. You've used it in Charlie X. We talked about in Wolf in the Fold, is the idea of turning the Enterprise into a hell ship. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is actually the biggest example, because it is not our Enterprise. We're in this other place, and this is literally a hell ship. People are, torture is a regular part of this universe. That's the thing right there. That it is a hell ship. It's a hell ship through the eyes of our landing party. Right. But through the eyes of the people who serve it's on normal. the ISS Enterprise, it is business as usual. This is the routine. This is the empire. This yeah. is the way of the empire. Which, they, by the way, the empire. I'm wondering if George Lucas was inspired by this episode when he created the empire for Star Wars. Could be. There Could are a be. lot of other Possibly. empires in yeah. history. Yeah, that's true. There's the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, but... So there were a lot of differences with this episode, starting with the teaser. So, Steve, in the earlier outlines, when Kirk beams up to the Enterprise, he is beaming up by himself. So he is not with the landing mm. party. So Scotty, Uhura, McCoy are not with him. And he's not beaming up from the Halkin planet. He's beaming up from the planet Rigel 4. Mm. So we were just uh, talking about Rigel 4 yeah. with Wolf in the Fold. Um, but the Enterprise is struck not by a magnetic ion storm, by what was called in that early version. It was called a warp storm. When he beams aboard the Enterprise, it's McCoy who has a beard, not mm. Spock. And uh, at one point, Kirk emerges 
from the shower in his quarters where he is greeted by a woman named Anna, who is his wife hmm. in the Mirror Universe. This is all just in the teaser. In the for teaser? The, in the, for the earlier wow. outline. Yeah, this is a pretty long teaser. But it was Gene Roddenberry's rewrite of Bill B- uh, <laughs> Bill Bixby. <laughs> Don't make him angry. <laughs> it is Gene Roddenberry's rewrite of Jerome Bixby's outline that made the parallel universe more of an opposite one full of fear and terror. Mm, that's very interesting. Oh, so so in the other one, it was a different universe, but not necessarily an Correct. opposite new. Oh, that's very very interesting. And and there are there are many other differences in this universe that we'll get into as we as gotcha. we keep going. Uh, we're back in Act One. So, and the first thing that happens is that Nimoy drops the agonizer, Mm -hmm. or Spock drops the agonizer. And I want to point out, I'm going to make a weird comparison. We've seen so many times Leonard Nimoy's ability to make subtle adjustments. And one of the best examples is not a particularly good episode, but if you watch an Operation Annihilate, how much pain is he dealing with? How is he dealing with it? What is happening with him moment to moment? And he does such an amazing job. I think he does such an incredible job of being Spock, it's still Spock, but being Spock with a hard edge, being Spock who's in a different culture, who is callous, who is capable of brutality, because that's the world that he's in. Well, I was going to actually ask you this question later on. I wonder if it's the same question I was going to ask you. Uh, it, it was it, it was absolutely a sort of going on your, your observation of this just now. Like, what do these two Spocks have in common and what makes them different? Literally, that's the question I was going to ask you. And let me let me let me add to it a little <laughs> bit. I, and I was debating about when to ask it, so I'm glad we're here. To me, there's three possibilities. Okay. Possibility number: the question is, are they genetically identical? Okay. Because it could be that they are literally exactly the same people, but they exist in a different culture, and and their history and experiences and the culture they're brought up with leads to the differences in their personality. It could be that they are genetically different. That they are actually that that people in this universe are more evil on some they look the same, but actually they aren't exactly the same people. Or it could be that there's a little bit of a combo, maybe one tiny gene out of place and also different experiences. Okay, what- well, well, so so the first of all, the uh, if if everything in this alternate universe is evil, uh, that the 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 Halkins are not. They are still peaceful people, as we see when. Kirk tries to negotiate with him from the bridge of the of the mirror enterprise. So so the question is like, is he genetically different or is he still the same person? Uh, I think he is the same person. But and and I think that the two Spocks, I mean, even Kirk observes that he is very much like our own Mr. Spock, but his loyalties are different. And in the prime universe, Spock sort of, you know, went against his family's wishes, his father's wishes, to join Starfleet. And his loyalty was to Starfleet, and his loyalty was to his commander, right. you know, James Kirk, and before him, Christopher Pike. Right. So now in this mirror universe, his loyalty is to the Empire. His loyalty is to the Imperial Starship Enterprise. So it is still the same Spock. He is still, he's still uh, 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 it, it commanding and doing his... Uh, duties with logic. He's still loyal to his James Kirk, who was a very, very different person. But it is because of who he is loyal to, who he is serving for, that brings out his more sinister qualities, more uh, sort of the darker side of him. I don't want to, I wouldn't say that this Spock is evil because he's still, he's still operating from the standpoint of logic and lo- and and certainly loyalty. I think he's the same person, but everything around him is different, and making him seem a little different. But he is still very much like Kirk said, like our own Mister. So is that true of everybody? Is Kirk the same person? No, is Sulu I, the same person? No, absolutely not. But I think that why we not? Have it, well, because we I I think based on how much time we have to observe Spock, that's just my opinion, and and the fact that when we see when we see later on when Spock does the mind melt with McCoy and he says, why did the captain let me live? Uh, I think he's still operating from much the same logic and friendship and loyalty that Prime Universe operated from, but because he is, everything around him is different, 
that that's why uh, he he's showing a, a darker and more sinister side. But he's still he's still no. Spock. I get I get that. That's not my question. My question is everybody else. So Spock is genetically identical. Is Kirk genet- genetically identical? Well, that's a really great question, and uh, you know, based on what little information I have to go on, I'm going to say that that, that genetically. They are, they're different. I mean, Kirk looks like Kirk. Sue, Sue looks like Sue. Everybody looks like everybody else uh, to the point where they do look identical. But it's, it's uh, the fact that it is far easier as civilized people to, to behave like barbarians than it is for barbarians to behave like civilized people. That's why the people in the Prime Universe have the landing party figured sure. out much, much sooner than the uh, people in the mirror universe. But I, I do think that, you know, just that genetically speaking, uh, I mean, if they look exactly the same, genetically speaking, that would make me assume that, yes, they are genetically the same. But it doesn't sound like you feel that way. No, I do. That is exactly what I think. Oh. I do think they're genetically the same. Um, and I think it's really it's a really important distinction. I know we're, like, getting bogged down. We're at the beginning of Act 1. So, so maybe we'll kind of hit this again a little bit later. But... But to me, not only do I think that, but I think it's extremely important that they are genetically the same in terms of the ideas of the show. It's way more interesting if they're genetically the same. If they're different, then they're different people. Then right. it's not well, as right. interesting. And, and, and I also think that this is, you know, there are a lot more mirror episodes that happen in later series of Star Trek, and this is what they get wrong, is they often are thinking, we're going to the universe where everyone is evil. Instead of, we're going to a universe where everyone is the same, but their circumstances have led them to behave differently. Well, that's exactly my point. The circumstances in which Spock is operating in the mirror universe has led him to behave differently. But he's still he's still operating like the Spock that well, we know. And led Sulu to behave differently, and led Kirk to behave differently, and all of these people are behaving differently because... And the thing is, that says something interesting about humans that we could be in a circumstance where people do terrible things and not actually be evil inside, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas if they're they're intrinsically different, it doesn't say anything interesting about humans. Well, I I completely agree with that. Um, But we're right just at the very (laughs) beginning of Act 1. Yes, Nimoy's performance is amazing. Scott, Storm has caused some minor damage in your section. There are also injuries requiring your attention, Doctor. And nobody moves. Right, like everybody's like waiting around. And by the way, when, when you hear that theme music at the top of the episode, when you see the title, it says Mirror, Mirror, which is obviously from Sleeping Beauty. The, the theme that when it was used in Balance of Terror was, was Romulan Agitato. Mm. But when it was reworked for Mirror, Mirror, the new theme is called Black Ship in Space. Mm, interesting. Um, and this is when Kyle reports that not his mistake, but there was a weird power fluctuation, and Spock asks... This will be a result of a severe storm. Captain, do you feel any abnormal effects? And I love Shatner's reaction. I love the way he plays this. Like, ooh, this is an opportunity. Yep. And he seizes it. Yes. Dr. McCoy, you better look us over. That was a rough beam-up. Well, this is what I mean by him observing and then reacting super quickly right. in a way because this is the, what the key to what uh, Kirk is so good at and what Shatner is so good at playing is playing layers is we see that he's uncomfortable and doesn't know what's going on but he needs to present something that appears to look like what Spock and the crew of the Mirror Universe Enterprise would expect and so him feeling a little dazed he actually can use that and they exit they, they're going down the corridor, and I love watching Shatner because he keeps getting this imperial salute. Him figuring it out and realizing how he's going to salute back, and each one gets a little bit more natural right, right. as he, he does them. He gets, uh, I wouldn't say more comfortable, but he gets into the rhythm and the flow and the routine yeah. of it. And by the way, the corridors of the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. So in, in order to make the Imperial Starship Enterprise uh, look different from the United Starship Enterprise, Jerry Finneran brought down the lighting just a little bit. He he created different shadows to make the Enterprise look like a darker ship. But also, there are a lot of extras on the ship. The, the Enterprise, the Mirror Enterprise, is a busy starship. Absolutely. We get to sickbay. Everything is a mess. McCoy is commenting. Everything's out of place. Oh, not everything. That spot. I spilled acid there a year ago. I think that's a fascinating thing. And, and, and I, I would say, the, thinking a ton about the mirror universe, it will fall apart. 
But the idea, if that acid spill says, no, these are the same people. There's lots of parallels, but things are not identical. Jim, what in blazes is this? I don't know. It's our enterprise. But it isn't. And he's figuring this out pretty quick. Yeah, he is. Not our universe. Not our ship. Something parallel. He latches right onto that, that it's a parallel universe where everything is the same. And he pauses and he says, almost. Another Enterprise? Spark with a beard? Another Captain Kirk, another Dr. McCoy, and... And what's great, and these are the subtle things that I think make this episode really good, yep. is there's you see on Uhura's face, and I can picture the ellipse, dot, 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 in the script, um, and you see her face, she went, oh my God, there's another one of me. There's another, another, yeah, she didn't even say the word. No, you could see on her reaction yep. that that is the thought that she's having in her, in her mind. If we're here, then our counterparts must have been transporting up at the exact same time. Similar storms on both universes disrupted the circuits. We're here, and there... Pause. ...on our enterprise. So this is what I love about this moment. We're already speculating that while the prime landing party is here on the mirror enterprise, the mirror landing party has materialized on the prime enterprise. So we are hearing about it before we see it. So in our heads, we're already thinking, even though we've seen it a million times, but, but try and imagine the first time you saw it, you start to imagine, ooh, I wonder what that looks like. I wonder what the mirror universe landing party will look like on the Prime Enterprise yep. and how they're interacting with Spock. Yeah, I, it's funny because in my mind, when, every time we get to this moment, I go, wait, this isn't where we cut to the Prime Enterprise to see it. But it's great. I love how you said it. It lives in our minds yes, exactly. for a while. Mm -hmm. What about the Hawkins? We can't let them be destroyed. And he asked Scotty to mess up the phasers somehow to buy them some time. By the way, if you're going to be stuck in a mirror universe... It's good to have Scotty. It's good to have Scotty with you. <laughs> um, and again, Kirk is right in command. He has the plan. Scotty's going to mess up the phasers. We're going to use the communicators because our communications are going to be monitored. We're going to scramble them on a different frequency. He needs a horror to get up to her post to find out what his orders are and what options he might have. And Uhura has a moment where she says, I'm, I'm, she's scared. She's scared. She won't say the word. And I love Kirk and, and Uhura in this moment. Uhura, you're the only one who can do it. I'll be right there. Yes, sir. And I will say, I am confident this is the greatest Uhura episode in the, in the series. Agreed. And it really shows what she's capable of and what we didn't get to see that much of. Because she's fantastic. She's in fantastic, this and especially in the second half of the episode. And we get up to the bridge. The sound of the bridge is different. The sound of the bridge is different. The lighting is different. We see that the captain's chair has a higher back. Mm -hmm. uh, is it? It's little subtle touches yep. like this. Like I said, that the fact that they had a different transporter effect, and and even like the back of Kirk's chair is higher. Which, and they reused that chair as a Commodore Wesley's chair on the USS Lexington in the ultimate computer. But, but when you hear Sulu's uh, scanner coming up and he's uh, addressing Mr. Chekhov, he, George Decay, uh, subtle touches, different. I mean, obviously a big overt touch is the massive scar he right. has on his uh, face. How did he get that scar, do you think? In a knife fight when someone tried to assassinate him. I was going to say maybe he got it fencing. Oh, Fencing with live blades. Fencing with live blades. Well, and this, I had a, a teacher in film school. I don't know if I mentioned him. One of my teachers was Chuck Rosen, who was the executive producer, the showrunner on the original 90210. Oh. So he was, you know, a serious. I know that name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great teacher, great person. And the thing he said over and over again is execution is everything is that he says it's not about ideas. Ideas are great. It's all the little tiny details. That's what makes good stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example. There was no need to change the chair or change the sound or change the way the transporter worked or change the... You could have done all of it without all these details. But all these details are what make this episode, this world feel sure. so right. great. It feels like a different world, doesn't it? Absolutely. It 100% does. So I think we have to discuss a thing... Okay. That, you know, this is 2021 and the idea of, you know, objectifying people and staring at them is, is something that we're changing the way we're thinking about. Uhura looks amazing. She does look amazing. I and, mean, you know, the, the, uh, 
look, the, the fact that in the Prime universe, the uh, female crew members are wearing miniskirts. But yeah. when you look at the first two pilots, the women are wearing pants, pants, yeah. Yeah. just like the men are. I mean, they, they're wearing like the same uniform. The shirts are different, but the pants are the same. So so what the series, they put them in miniskirts. And, and, and every now, woman we meet is in some ridiculous sure, outfit. Sure. Yeah. And that's William Ware, Bill Tice. Uh, mm-hmm. His nickname was Bill Tice. So he was the costume designer for the original series. And for the women in the Mirror Universe, uh, they are even more objectified. It's even more sexist because not only are you having uh, the women wear basically bikinis, yeah. uh, you also, you know, woman we are going to meet is the captain's woman. So, you know, that's her job. But... Uh, in, in the case of what this universe, this mere universe, is all about, it is fitting for that universe, I think, to look at woman that way. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not you know, in, in the prime universe in 1967 and certainly in 2021 or going into 2022, absolutely positively no way. But in the, in the context of watching that this is a a parallel universe, a sinister universe, uh, where where equality is absolutely positively not the thing. It services the episode well. Well, and I also, it's it, I wouldn't just say that equality isn't the thing. Sex is clearly a part of the hierarchy, just as violence is a For part sure. of the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And the thing, too, about it is, A, this is also a horror at her strongest. So, yes, she is definitely put in an outfit. And, B... Uh, you've been to, f- I've been to a bunch of comic book conventions, only one Star Trek convention as an adult. You've been to a ton. How much cosplay have you seen of this Uhura outfit? A lot. Because it's not just guys that love it. It is a absolutely iconic look. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely it is. Yes, I definitely see a lot of cosplay when it comes to the mirror universe women uniforms. Yes, absolutely. Um, and... She kind of gives a long look around. We see Chekhov at his station looking surly and angry. And she goes over to her communication station and Sulu comes over after and leans in, grabs her by the chin and says, Still no interest, Uhura. Hmm? I could change your mind. And she looks up at him and says, You are away from your post, mister. Is the captain here? Is Spock here? And the cat's away. And just as she smacks his hand away, like she smacks his hand away, yes. she's first. Yes. Okay, she takes the proactive, like, hey, don't touch me. And then he mo- motions to grab her. No, he motions to hit her. He motions to hit her. He's about to backhand her. It's really clear to me. And then at that moment, Kirk walks on the bridge, and everybody is at attention mm-hmm. and gives the salute all at the same time in unison. And... Yeah, by this point, Kirk knows the drill, <laughs> and well, he gives it right back. Well, and, and what we know by this, by the way, is that this is not the first time Sulu has approached Uhura in the Mirror Universe. She has turned him down multiple times in Good the past. Point. Good and point. W- and one of the things she sa- he says is, I could change your mind. Well, we know from meeting Marlena later on in this episode that sex and these relationships are how one of the ways that women, and maybe men too, who knows, Gain power and gain prestige. Correct. And That's Sulu right. seems to be the th- like the third ish in command in this particular universe. And so when he says, "I could change your mind," what's he talking about? Oh well, I thought he was going to say, "Let's have sex." So yeah. yes, he is asking for sex, but he is offering something. He's saying, "I could change your mind by getting you a promotion, by or I could change your mind. I'm going to be violent to you if you don't agree to sex." That I could change your mind means there's some other thing that is going to convince you to have sex. That's what that part of the line means. Okay, what, what, I, what I always, I see your point. What I always thought that line to me, still no interest, I could change your mind. Like, like at this point, they have not had sex yet. No, they haven't. Okay. Of course not. So, so that his way of saying I could change your mind, you know, like after we have sex, you'll, you know, You'll like it. You'll like it. Exactly. Ah, okay. That's how I saw it. So we have now drilled down for far too much time on one line, but welcome to Enterprise. Welcome to Enterprise Instance. So, uh, so Kirk has entered, uh, and man, this time when he gives that salute back, he's he's kind of got it down. He's got it down, yeah. exactly. Communication status. No storm damage, sir. All stations report normal. You're ordered to annihilate the Hawkins unless they comply. No alternative. He goes to the chair. The phasers are locked on target. 
we're approaching optimum range, and Kirk is not answering. It's and, not well, saying yeah, anything. Sulu was saying, commence fire. Captain. Stand by, Mr. Sulu. We cut to Scotty, who opens the door to engineering, and there is a big dude there. Do you have authorization from security, sir? Captain Jordis. Which, on his enterprise... Right. That's that's who he answers to. Well, and this is his engineering room. There's no reason why he wouldn't be able to do whatever the hell he wants. And, and, and on this enterprise, Sulu, as security chief, has a whole lot more power on the mirror enterprise than he does on the prime enterprise. And I love. And so Scotty walks away, and he calls up to the captain, and he does it over the regular comms. And what I love is what he says is, "Days a report, sir. No damage." And, and just the, the the disappointment that Kirk cannot truly show and he does a very good thank you mr uh, scott like he's like so disappointed but he's trying to hold it together and not give himself away well and what's great about the line is it's a way for scotty to publicly inform kirk that my attempt to sabotage the phasers failed right but i'm saying in a way that everybody can hear limit's rotation is carrying primary target beyond arc of phaser lock shall i correct orbit to new firing position kirk softly says no and you see Spock react to that? Lieutenant Uhura, contact the Hawking Council. I wish to talk to them again. Yes, sir. This is where, okay, Kirk's starting to act weird. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's starting to notice yeah. that Kirk is acting strangely. This is a new race. They offer other things of value besides dilithium crystals. But it is clear that we cannot expect their cooperation. They've refused the Empire. Which, from what we saw in the first scene when it wasn't the Empire, it was the Federation, they were refusing that. One, so of course they're refusing this one for sure. But that's what I mean, like what what I was saying before. Yeah. that not everyone in this universe is evil. The Halkins are still peaceful people. Well, and that's why I go. That's why I go. The idea of f- it's intrinsic that every single person is the opposite of what they were in our universe is a dumb way to approach things. I, I agree. It makes the stories less interesting, mm-hmm. whereas this makes the story more interesting. Command procedure dictates that we provide the customary example. And while they're talking about that, the secondary target is moving beyond phaser's lock. Put phasers on standby, Mr. Zulu. And this is a big deal. A serious breach of orders, Captain. Because they just expected that Kirk was going to wipe out the Hawkins. This has definitely raised the concern of Sulu and especially Spock. Yeah. But they're, they're not on to them yet. I have my reasons. And I'll make them clear to you. In my own good time. And now the Hawkins come on the screen and Kirk... Plays the he's figured out. Okay, I'm beginning to understand what the Kirk li- is like in this universe, and says, "It is useless to resist us. We do not resist you." But did you notice that even though the Halkins are are still peaceful, that Tharn, the council leader, looks different, doesn't he? Yeah. Why do you think that is? I I think they've had a rougher life. Yeah, I agree. I think they've been. I think. I mean, this wasn't just their first experience with the Empire. I think the Empire has been messing with them already. Yeah, I, you know? I think that's that's a fair assessment, that they've been through more and that it has been more taxing on them to stay true to their peaceful ideals. Yeah. Uh, but clearly, Tharn, uh, played by Vic Perrin here, uh, looks like he's uh, he's not as uh, kept well, as he was in the Prime and Universe. And frankly, he knows they're all going to die. The guy we met in the Prime Universe is pretty sure the Federation is going to say okay and leave. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. this one is like, we know who the Empire is. We're all going to die. Right. That's a good point, too. Excellent point. You have 12 hours to consider your position. 12 years, Captain Kirk, or 12,000. We are ethically compelled to deny your demand for our dilithium crystals, for you would use their power to destroy. I love the Hawkins. They're great. We will level your planet and take what we want. That is destruction. You will die as a race. To preserve what we are. Like he is not moving. 12 hours, no more. Close communications. Turn phases off. <laughs> and, and that's like, <laughs> what's going on? 12 hours, Captain. That is unprecedented. He looks at Spock and he says, I shall be in my quarters. And there's this great moment, great little subtle moment that nothing is said, but Kirk just looks at Uhura, just like shakes his head. And she looks back at him and just, like, smiles. What do you think that moment is? Like, I don't know what to do. Oh, I interpret it differently. Uh, I, I see that as Ahura is ready to get the hell off the bridge. She's scared and freaked out. Oh. And he shakes his head saying, no, you no, got to stay. stay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's probably a good point, too. Because she said that she was scared when they were in sickbay. Yeah. And now she went up there before he did, and now he's leaving before she can. And, yeah, I think that's that's a... That 
that absolutely is what that scene was, that she was wanted to go with him, and he, like, shook his head, like, no, you got to stay. And she smiled and, like, I understand. What, we, we, t- we talked about this a long time ago where we talked about the difference between A stories, B stories, and C stories and a single story that has multiple threads. And that later Star Trek tends to do A stories and B stories and sometimes C stories. And that original series, when it's really good, will frequently have multiple threads. This is a perfect example. Absolutely. Because we have a whore who's scared, who has to face her fear on the bridge. And on the bridge, she discovers there's this guy who is after her, Sulu. We ha- and that's, that's one thread that's going to go on. We have, obviously, the Spock-Kirk thread. We have the Halkin thread. Like, we have all these, but they're all supporting a single whole of a story. Captain, you placed yourself in a most brave position. This conduct must be reported. You're at liberty to do so, Mr. Spock. And here is another thread that's going on. Because while all of this is happening, if that wasn't enough, we see Chekhov switch some switches on his panel and get up. We see that Sulu, by the way, notices that Chekhov is doing and that Chekhov ends up in the turbo lift before Kirk. So here is a whole other thing that's going on. So Chekhov has alerted somebody that they're coming. And he says, Deck 5, sir. And Kirk nods. Without looking at him. Without looking at him. Because it's Chekhov. It's mm-hmm. the sweet guy who always makes those funny Russian jokes. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. he's young, he's new, but he's got a lot of potential. He's 22. That's, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's who this guy is. And the door of the turbo lift opens and immediately get Kirk gets a palm to the face. And there are a couple of big guys there. And Chekhov, with a phaser on Kirk, says, So you die, Captain. And the way you all move up in the rank. No one will question the assassination of a captain who has disobeyed prime orders of the Empire. What a well-directed scene. Like, the camera is on the turbo lift doors as the doors open, and you see this hand smack yep. Kirk in the face. Totally out of nowhere. Out of yeah. nowhere. He is... He, Absolutely is not expecting it, but now he's got a bloody lip. Like, how they actually filmed that must have been really, re- I mean, it's a really well shot scene. Oh, it's easy. It's that wouldn't be so hard to film. Um, because you're not that, you don't have to be that close to Kirk to make, to make, to sell that palm strike. Because um, it, stunts like that, they're all about the angle that you're at. And so, because you're behind the palm, you can't actually see how far the palm is from the, the but face. But where did the blood come from? Uh, the blood was already there. That's what I think. The blood was there, and what, like, so, like, it was the timing where yeah. just as the hand was in front of yep. Kirk's face, he just let the blood kind of just come out. I, now I have, now, okay, now I have to look at it. Let's look at it. Hold on. Okay. So stand by, Enterprise Incidents. Right, stand by, Enterprise Incidents. We're back, Enterprise Incidents. We've examined frame by frame, and we have the solution. The blood is in Kirk's mouth. His mouth is closed when the door opens, and then he spits a little bit out on his lip. Right after the strike happens. Again, an extremely well orchestrated yep. scene. Yep. Well directed. And so we're only in act one. And we have seen our entire primary cast, including Walter Koenig, George Takei, Jimmy Dewan, and Nichelle Nichols, really add so much to this ensemble performance of this episode that is one of the many things that makes Mirror Mirror just so absolutely great. And one thing we're doing, like one of the things that I teach and one of the things I think the job of the writer is, so the writer is God. That's their job. But they're not a nice God. They're an angry, mean, vengeful, betraying, nasty God because the job is, is to make things hard on your characters. The layers of things that we've gotten that are hard on these characters culminating with, oh my God, people are going to try to assassinate them. You know, we got the Hulkins, we have Sulu, we have the other universe, we have how are we going to get back? And now we have assassination is just turning up the, the, the t- intensity over and over again. That's why it makes it such a great end of Act One. It is just such a testament to the staff, the producers, the writers of Star Trek that they took the original outline in the early versions of Mirror Mirror, turned it from what it was into what it became. So... Clearly, I mean Jerome Bixby coming out with the with the story and and his first uh, his first two drafts, but then you have Roddenberry rewriting, Gene Kuhn doing a polish, Dorothy Fontana doing a polish, and that is why when you look at some of the differences from Act One, namely 
that in the mirror universe, in the parallel universe from the earlier versions of the story, the Federation was battling a race called the Tharn. Hmm. So when that was changed in later versions to the Halkins, they used the name Tharn sure. as the Halkin leader. Although, but the strange thing is that you never hear him called by his name. Right. But it's, it's in the script that his name is Tharn, right. but you never actually hear that. So in this early version of Mirror Mirror, the Mirror Federation is fighting a battle, a war against the Tharn, oh. and it is losing Wow. It is losing to the point where eventually the Federation will have to surrender. And the key point to point out here, Steve... Wait, the Federation is losing? The Federation okay. is losing Just because be in, sure. this, in this alternate universe, the Federation is not evil. Oh, They're right. not evil. It's just alternate, not... Yes, okay, it's I get it. Now I get it. in the sense that they are far less advanced. Oh. In fact, they are so far less advanced that the Federation in the mirror universe, they don't even have phasers. Hmm. When Kirk mentions a phaser, Spock basically says to him, what's a phaser? So that's how, that's how far behind they are, but they are not evil. The mirror enterprise was manned by a good and decent crew. But one other interesting thing here is, like I mentioned, that Kirk was alone when he beamed up to the enterprise in the teaser for the, for the right, earlier version. Right. Well, what's happening is, Kirk is having dizzy spells hmm. in the mirror universe. Like the alternate universe is rejecting him hmm. like he is an invading disease. Hmm. And one other thing is that when Gene Roddenberry did his polish and did his rewrite, he made better use of the Enterprise supporting characters. In earlier versions of the story, there were two security guards named Hudson and Larson. Gene Roddenberry took their characters and gave their actions to the Mirror Universe Sulu. Ah. And smart move. <laughs> well, th I mean, over and over again, we've heard this of like, there are times where we introduce a, a new uh, guest character that's really important, but in general, don't give something to a nobody. Give it to one of our people. Right. We, that's who we're involved in. Um, it's so interesting because the, I, the difference is what are we exploring? And in the version, the older version, it's exploring technology and it's exploring like just you're you're in a world that is different. Whereas in this one, we're exploring good and evil on on a, on a fundamental way. Sure. Absolutely. You know? So it's deeper. So we're back in act two. And fortunately, one of Chekhov's henchmen decides to switch sides and knocks the phaser out of his hand, out of Chekhov's hand, giving Kirk a chance to fight back. And that guy, once he gets his, he has a phaser. He kills one of the guards. Um, Kirk takes another guy out with a really good hip throw. I think you said that he's studying judo at this time. His his throws are getting better. Yeah, he, he yeah. he's this this is a great way to kick off Act Two with yeah. a fight. Phasers two guys, and then once we've already sort of won, out of the turbo lift comes these other two big guys dressed in blue. And what we find out is these are Kirk's personal guard. Okay, now the uh, the guy Farrell. Uh, the bigger guy, the bald guy, is uh, Pete Kellett. And he was also seen in Spock's Brain and mm. Day of the Dove. He was one of the Klingons in Day mm. of the Dove. Mm -hmm. So this guy, Wilson, Wilson, who basically saves Kirk's life here, is Garth Pillsbury. Easy, Farrell. I did your job. Because he is basically, he was working with Chekhov, and Kirk's guard was nowhere around when their guy got attacked, probably because Kirk, at this point, didn't even know he had a guard right. and was supposed to do that. And what I love is that Wilson has decided, like, I think my odds are better supporting Captain Kirk than they were supporting Chekhov. And right, he exactly. says, Mr. Chekhov is going to make me a chief, sir. You could make me an officer. And Kirk, I love how he, he plays this, because he's like, okay, he's already figured out what's going on here. All right, you're working for me. And then he builds it up. A commission? You're in line. You might even make captain. Yes, sir. And the guy's all excited, and then Kirk punches in them in the face. And oh! Not on my ship. I, I, I love it. And the, the Kirk's guard grabs Chekhov and says, the booth for this one, sir? And here's one of the key things. Scott, if you're ever in a mirror universe and somebody uses a term and you have no idea what it is... Go along with it. Go along. You can't say, what's a booth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. He goes, yes, because he knows that's what's expected at that moment. Uh, we're in sickbay. 
And I love that Kirk walks in and McCoy goes, What's this? It's called blood. Watch your step. The officers move up by assassination. Shakov tried it on me. And Scotty says, Mr. Sulu's in charge of security like the ancient Gestapo. The ancient Gestapo, which by this point was only 22 years old. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Um, and, and McCoy, this one's maybe even scarier. In my sick bay is a chamber of horrors. Two of my assistants were betting on the tolerance of an injured man, how long it would take him to pass out from the pain. Here's the thing. I, I'm not going to hit this. I don't want to hit this in a heavy way, a very heavy way. But this is why I think it's really important that these people are not genetically evil. Because... We hear that like, oh my God, two people betting about how long, that's horrible. And yet humans have done that in history in all, you know, like pick your favorite set of atrocities, you know, that people have mistreated humans in all sorts of horrible ways. And the most disturbing thing about those stories is that those are ordinary people, you know, that they weren't just like born evil. They were raised in a society where evil was normal. Right, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. yes, some of them absolutely were evil, but some of them were just like you and me. And the idea that the crew of the Enterprise, and here's the thing, who was McCoy on this Enterprise? McCoy was a guy who t at least, at the very least, tolerated people making bets like this. Right. And yeah, we, we don't we don't have no idea what McCoy was like in the mirror universe. I mean, him saying, my sick bay is a chamber of horrors. There are plenty of places where science has been used as a chamber of horrors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not Oh, wrong. absolutely. A chamber of horrors. So there are plenty of places, like I said. You brought up the Gestapo, and I said it was only 22 years old. Yeah. There was a lot going. There, was, a lot there, of there were a lot of chambers of horrors, of horrors in uh, you know, World War II. And we could say, like, all German people that participated in the Holocaust were genetically evil. But that is not the, that is not the scary thing. Correct. The scary thing is they're us. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Report on technology. Mostly variations in instrumentation. Nothing I can't handle. Star readings. Everything's exactly where it should be, except us. And I love this. I love that the computer's voice is a male. Computer. Ready. So the interesting thing, and this is something I never knew in all these years, the male voice of the computer is John Winston, who played oh. Kyle. Wow, that's I interesting. I did not know that until I was doing my research for this that's episode. That's really cool. Yes. Now, now uh, the one place that I actually saw that, uh, I'm hoping that it's right, but if it is, I learned something I never knew about Star Trek, that the male voice of the computer on the ISS, ISS Enterprise is that of John Winston, who played Kyle, who was already working on this episode anyway, but it was actually when Gene Kuhn was the showrunner and he was producing this this episode, Gene Roddenberry did not want the voice of the computer to be a male. Oh, really? He wanted it to stay female. Mm. But Kuhn ignored him, and the voice was a male. And I actually think that that lends uh, another Kuhn's level to the episode. Totally right. It's one more detail. And the first thing they do is uh, set up a secured research thing that only S Scotty and Kirk can use their voice prints to get into. And it basically, he asked the computer, is it possible that the Ion Storm sent us to a parallel universe? And the computer goes, yeah, smart computer. <laughs> and then yeah. he goes, could we use our technology to get back to our universe? And the computer goes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, how would we do it? And the computer, computer goes, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, record procedure, and which he, it does in like a split second. And he puts it on a little disc. And I love that before Scotty looks at what the procedure is, he says, I'll need help. You'll be too conspicuous. And then he looks over at McCoy, who says, I'm a doctor, not an engineer. No, you're an engineer. <laughs> and that's when McCoy asked, Jim, the way this ship is run, what kind of people are we in this universe? Let's find out. Computer. Ready. Read out official record of current command. Captain James T. Kirk succeeded to command ISS Enterprise through assassination of Captain Christopher Pike. Whoa. That's just great. It's That's great. great. He assassinated Pike to get command of the Enterprise. Well, and, this, and this is, even though there isn't continuity the way we would later have it, this is the, oh, we remember history. Like, we know who Captain Pike is. And it also points out this thing, which we, of course, have tremendously today, which is 
There are going to be people who watch the episode who are in the know and people who aren't. There are going to be some people who just happen to miss the menagerie. They didn't get home that night in time, those two nights, in order to see it. They have no idea who Captain Pike is, and that's fine. That's totally fine. But for people who did watch it and remember the name, they go, oh, my God, it's that guy. Right. He killed that guy. And right. that gives you this great... And this is something that is going to become a huge part of geek culture. And, you know, people watching WandaVision and looking for every single possible reference to every single comic in history... That's that's where this is kind of the beginning of that kind of thing. It's it's such a great image too. You know, after after Kirk really helped Captain Pike uh, in in the menagerie at the end have a have a live out his final days uh, with a better life, even if it's an illusion. That in the mirror universe, Kirk got to be the captain of the Enterprise by assassinating this guy. And then we hear a whole bunch of other horrible stuff that he's done, like executing 5,000 colonists on Vega 9. That's, that's uh, 5,000 colonists that he executed compared to the 4,000 colonists that Codus the Executioner It's going to say exactly the same thing. Wow. Is that, well, and again, if he's the genetically the same, that means that our Captain Kirk is capable of being Codus the Executioner. Ap excellent point. Yeah. And the one other thing we fi find out is that Scotty's like, I can do it. But there's going to be a light that lights up on Sulu's control panel, and so, and he'll see it. I only need a second. I'll tell Uhura to create a diversion to distract Sulu's attention. And we're going to head off to our post, and then McCoy asks this key question. Jim, if we're here, what do you suppose our counterparts are doing back in our universe? On our Enterprise. And I love the edit. It is a flip. Yes. The camera, it's like the camera flips and we see back in the Prime Universe, we see Captain Kirk in his green wraparound shirt being handled by security people. I order you! Let me go! He is struggling, and the security guards throw him in the brig where McCoy and Scotty and Uhura are waiting, and they're all angry, angry and yelling, and Shatner is right on point, perfectly over the top with his performance. Well, and you can see this is what's fun about getting to play Captain Kirk is he gets to do all this weird stuff because of who of the show that he's in and him laying into Spock. You traitorous pig, I'll hang you up by your Vulcan ears. I'll have you all executed. I think Spock ups his Spockness to contrast with the other Spock and because he is so calm. Very and he is so, yep. so like... I think not. Your authority on this ship is extremely limited, Captain. Just so, so dialed yeah. back, I think not. The fact that he says this ship means that he already knows they're not from here. Right. Well, he says, I, I, I need to figure out how that yeah. is to return you. But here's the thing. So the Prime Spock figured it out faster than the Mirror right. Spock. We, we hear why towards the end of the episode during the Kunism where it is easier to behave like a barbarian than it is for a bar bar barbarian to behave like a civilized person. I think you person. might be about to ask the same question that I'm going to ask. Okay, Let's but see. why don't you ask it? Okay. Well, the question I'm going to ask is, what happened? What happened? What? That, that, right. What happened? Like, what, what tipped them off? Was the I think I know Kirk? exactly what happened, Okay, you tell me. What did Kirk do? He beamed back on, and he said, lock phasers on the Hawkins <laughs> right. and prepare to open fire. He was going to kill the Hulkins. It was literally, I think, we were on the bridge. It was just like the Doomsday Machine where Spock countermands his order and says, you can't do that. And it's like, I'm going to relieve you of command and call security. I think that's what happened. That's absolutely what happened. Because like with the, when the Mirror crew, the Mirror landing party, beams back to the Prime Enterprise, like the they're going to stick out as barbarians like a sore thumb. And who's to say they even really tried to hide it all that much? The Mirror Kirk could have seized, used this as an opportunity. Wow, these people, this this crew, they're they're as peaceful as sheep. I'm gonna, I'm and this 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 galaxy, this this alternate galaxy, is is ripe for the picking. I can really take this thing over. Well, I don't think, but he hasn't figured out he's in an alternate galaxy because he's going. What's going on? Has a whole galaxy gone crazy? What kind of a uniform is this? Where's your beer? What's going on? Where's my personal guard? But I think you're right. When when they beamed back up, he was going to carry out his mission that he had from the mirror universe, 
to annihilate the Hawkins. And he get can you imagine like like our Captain Kirk, quote unquote, our Captain Kirk gets on the bridge, gets at the captain's chair, and he tells Sulu to lock face yeah. on target. They're like, what? <laughs> and then Kirk thinks he's figured it out, that mm. this is all part of some plan. plan. <laughs> all right, Spock. Whatever your game is, I'll play it. You want credits, I'll give them to you. You'll be a rich man. A commander your own? I can swing that too. Apparently, some kind of transposition has taken place. I find it extremely interesting. And he's walking away. And that great, that great laugh from Kirk, he goes, Spock, what is it that will buy you? Power? Fascinating. Power, Spock! I can get that for you! It's great. We're back in the mirror universe. Kirk's walking down the corridor, and there is Spock with his guard, and right. his guard is Vulcan. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. You are very observant, my friend. So there is Mirror Spock with a bodyguard. Not only a bodyguard, a Vulcan, a Vulcan. bodyguard. So you know whose idea that was for Spock to have, uh, for the Mirror Spock to have a bodyguard, was the director of the episode, mm. Mark Daniels. So I would say, do you recognize the actor playing Spock's bodyguard, but you probably don't because the episode that you saw him in previously, he was wearing some guard, the facial guard over his face, but he was playing a Vulcan because he was the guy, the Vulcan in a mock time that was going to kill McCoy when he interfered. Yeah, the big guy. With the pop far. He yeah. was the big guy. So his name is Russ Peak. And he was also seen as a background player in the Apple and Journey to Babel. Um, I think that, again, it's a tiny detail, but the fact that Spock has a Vulcan guard is great. Yep. I am pleased that you frustrated Mr. Chekhov's plan. I should regret your death. Is this true? Uh, yeah. I think so, too. Absolutely. 100% true. Because Spock is thinking logically. Yeah. This is our Spock. He's thought this through logically, and he says... And I am frankly content to be a lesser target. Logical, as always, Mr. Spock. He says another thing, too. I think that's, of course, totally true. The other line I find interesting as well. I much prefer my scientific duties. Mm. Because mm. this Spock is our Spock, he's and our he's Spock. a scientist. He loves science. And he's if he still a science kept, officer. Still, You're right. Yeah. And then we hear, split, for a split second, we hear it before we see it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we hear the voice of Chekhov. By the way, a note for Star Trek fans, the first time that we hear Chekhov screaming. The agony booth is a most effective means of discipline. Ooh, the agony booth. Again, this was another thing, that another moment from this episode that I vividly remember from that very first time I saw it. Because I thought, like, oh, Chekhov, this guy looks like a nice guy. I thought that he looked like Davy yeah. Jones from The Monkees. Yeah. And they're torturing him yeah. in, uh, in this booth. Um, and and I go like, man, if the agonizer, that little portable thing, really hurt, what does the agony booth do to you? Well, well, no one does a scream or <laughs> agony quite like Walter King. <laughs> now notice, Kirk takes a couple of steps forward mm. towards Chekhov. Mm. Why did he do that? Like, what was? What do you think he's thinking at that moment? Like, I think he's thinking the first thing he's thinking. You tried to kill me. And the second thing he thought of is, it's, it's not his fault, really. This is the condition he was brought up in this universe. It's fine. I never, I, I never thought about this moment. Uh, but, but I would think the, is, that's my Chekhov being tortured. You know, that's Chekhov, this person I care about being tortured. I mean, can you imagine you're in the alternate universe and suddenly you see evil Steve being tortured? You would still have a weird you know, oh, reaction sure. to it. Yeah. Even if I had punched you in the like face. Like he's processing it. Yeah. I presume you've ordered full duration. Again, these are the right answers. I haven't decided. I like that as they walk along that the two guards kind of join behind them. Right, yeah, because now, now Kirk's guard is standing along Spock's guard. Which my guess is they were behind these two guys all the time. Mm -hmm. That's right. just normal. They know each other, for sure. And Spock asks about what he's going to do with the Hawkins. They are, of course, in contradiction to standard Empire procedure. You cannot ignore the consequences. It's not a threat. I love the way this whole conversation goes. Because I think, A, Spock has thought a lot, obviously, about how he's going to deal with Kirk violating these orders. I do not threaten, Captain. I merely state facts. 
I have found you to be an excellent officer. Our missions together have been both successful and profitable. This dialogue, this exchange between Kirk and Spock in this, in this scene is, is where I really had my question for you that I asked earlier about uh, what, what makes these Spocks different. Are they different? Because this is where you see the circumstance that you pointed out. The circumstance is what's sort of making him quote-unquote evil. But really, he's our Spock. He's still thinking things through logically. He says, like you pointed out perfectly, which was really important, he says, I much prefer my scientific duties. He's still our Spock. It's everything around him that is bringing forth this motivation that where he, he is he's acting sinister. And I'm interested in successful and profitable. What it means is, is that we make money on mm, some level yep, on right. running these missions and that Spock likes that. I also am thinking about how good a team and how good friends are Kirk and Spock in the Mirror Universe. That's a great question. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that just the other day, re-watching this. If the Kirk that we saw violate orders to save Spock's life and in turn to have to fight him to the death in a mock time, is that the friendship that they have in this universe or is it more of a business partnership? I think, and we're going to have a little bit more evidence of this later, I think it is a fantastic partnership, not as intimate as the one in our universe. I agree with that. Not as close, but I, I also think this still might be their closest relationship, you know, and I think they really, really know they work well together. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing, watching the scene, where it really hit me how superb Leonard Nimoy's performance is, that I think Nimoy's performance in, a, in Mirror Mirror is up there with a mock time, with this side of paradise, and with the episode I really like a lot, uh, All Our Yesterdays, as one of his absolute finest performances of Spock. Yeah. It's funny. I really go, I can understand why Nimoy was really upset to be typecast as Spock or only remembered as Spock in the early 70s because, man, this guy's a good actor. He's an amazing actor. Really good actor. Do you think we should destroy the Hawkins? Terror must be maintained or the Empire is doomed. And Kirk's line, I think this is this is like, here we have this great episode, and yet we also are going to have lines in it that are really interesting, thought-provoking lines, and he says, Conquest is easy, control is not. We may have bitten off more than we can chew. That's Vietnam. Mm. That's Afghanistan. That is the struggle of the United States in the latter part of the 20th and 21st century. Completely agree. Is, conquest is easy. You know, control is not. Iraq. Conquest, the, the toppling the government in Iraq took a couple of weeks. Right. Control you know, is not. Control for the next decade uh, yeah. cost us a lot. And here it cost them a lot. And here's just one line. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, breaking that line down to its simplest form, it just it makes it so obvious, doesn't it? But if you continue on your present course, this confusing, inexplicable behavior is my concern, not yours. And then, I love this moment. He says, You would find me formidable enemy. And Spock's response is amazing. I'm aware of that, Captain. I trust that you are aware of the reverse. And there's a music sting, yep. and there's a look, and this is like, this is like, oh my god, this is the coolest thing ever. Okay. I love the look that Kirk gives to Spock as Spock is walking away. As Spock walks away, the camera zooms in on Kirk, and you see Shatner give like a, a smile like of, of admiration. Uh, he respects this guy. Yeah. Even in the, this mirror alternate savage universe, he still sees that he is very much like my own Mr. Spock. Yeah. And I admire this guy. I really respect him. He respects yep. him even though he better be careful or... Spock is going to kill him. <laughs> well, and he's seen this Spock do terrible things, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. torturing Kyle and now being part of torturing Chekhov. Yep. Um, but Kirk says to release Chekhov and confine him to a quarters, which gets a, like, what? We're doing what now? Yeah, yeah. The bodyguard's like, really? <laughs> um, and then we see McCoy give some security guy a shot that knocks him out. And we'll, he says, we'll hold him for six hours. And they sneak into engineering, where they're just up on the higher level, looking down at lots of extras. Things are really busy. On this enterprise, so so this is the first time we're seeing this elevated version mm. of auxiliary control. 
when they went to auxiliary control on the constellation, you know, it was on that it was on a set that looked right. completely different. But when they built that ladder to the second uh, level of engineering, and they moved on to this episode, they built this this other area where it was auxiliary control. So like you 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 know they've come back to this episode. Uh, you know, you see it in by any other name. You see it mm-hmm. in the Tholian web. Um, but this is the first time we're seeing this version of auxiliary control overlooking the engineering deck of the Enterprise. Very cool. Kirk's arrived at his quarters, and again, it's a tiny detail. There's a guard there who has to unlock his door for him. It's a totally... I sm- never noticed yeah, that. Totally small detail. He has to unlock his door for yes. him. I never noticed that. Um, and he walks into his quarters. And, and here we are at 23 minutes and 43 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Make a note of that, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time we are seeing the captain's woman, Marlena Morell, and we hear that beautiful theme, Marlena's theme, which was reused in uh, the next episode produced, uh, The Deadly Years. I fell asleep. <sighs> we had quite a time in the chem lab picking up after the storm. And she immediately goes and gets two drinks. And this is very clear that she is very, very comfortable in the captain's quarters, and she is doing what she does every time Kirk comes home from a hard day at the office. Meet Barbara Luna, who plays Marlena Moreau. She was 27 years old when she did Star Trek. On Broadway, she was in shows like South Pacific Mm. and The King and I. On film, she was in Ship of Fools with Vivian Lee. Fire Creek with Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda. The Concrete Jungle with Jill St. John. Mm. On TV, she was in shows like Zorro, The Untouchables, Hawaiian Eye, Buck Rogers in the 25th (laughs) Century. Remember the season two premiere when they introduced Hawk and Hawk had a wife named Corey? No memory. No, no, I have no no memory memory? of that show. No, I I watched Uh, it. I watched it, but I don't have any memory. I love Buck Rogers in the 25th century. So, yeah, she played Corey in season two, or at least the the two-parter for the first season. She was reunited with William Shatner for an episode of T.J. Hooker. Uh, She was on the the soap opera Search for Tomorrow, One Life to Live, and she was in the Star Trek fan series called Star Trek Mm. Phase 2. And she's great, by the way. Yeah, she's she's terrific. And the first thing she talks about is him getting attacked by Chekhov, and she's basically going, you got lucky. I cannot believe you got caught off guard like that. You're still in trouble with Starfleet Command. What you've got in mind this time is beyond me. You're scheming, of course. Because she knows Kirk really, really well. He doesn't do anything without a plan. Well, what, what is Kirk doing at this point? What is he doing at this He's point? He's observing. He's observing. You're totally right. Well, and he knows that <laughs> this is a really good rule, is that... The more you say, the more are things that people can find fault with. So he says very little, and that leads her to draw her own conclusions. And she says, Is it all some clever means to advance you to the Admiralty? Kirk, the cabinet itself? Further than that, if I'm successful. Which, to be clear, he has no idea what's going has no, There's no plan. Nope. He doesn't know anything about how the Empire works. But he works. sure does make it yep. convincing. Uh, Makes it look like he knows what's going on. If I'm to be the woman of a Caesar, can't I know what you're up to? All right, this is the second time we've heard a love interest refer oh, that's to true. Kirk yeah. as a Caesar. Because we heard Lenore Caridian mm-hmm. refer to Kirk as a Caesar of the stars in The Conscience of the King. Interesting. Well, and frankly, it I, my guess is this Kirk in the Mirror Universe could be a Caesar. Absolutely. Yeah, and they have a big, long kiss. And I'm just going like, what is Kirk thinking, you know, at this moment? <laughs> Maybe the universe isn't so bad <laughs> after this, all. Yeah, like this is kind of getting sort of interesting. <laughs> but in the midst of that, he gets uh, a hail and he sits down and it's Spock. Mr. Spock, Captain. Yes. I received a private communication from Starfleet Command. I am committing a breach of regulations by informing you of its contents. That shows true loyalty. I think that really is evidence that he genuinely has a relationship with this Absolutely. Captain Absolutely, and he respects he respects his captain, even though his captain is acting very much out of character. I am instructed to wait until planet dawn over principal target to permit you to carry out our mission. And if I don't? In that event, I am ordered to kill you and to proceed against the Halkins as the new captain of the Enterprise. 
And that is a hell of an end. To act two. To now let me ask you a question. Yes. And this is something I thought about during my rewatch for Enterprise Incidents mm -hmm. of Mirror Mirror. Now, like you so correctly and perceptively have pointed out how great Kirk is at observing, mm -hmm. at absorbing, of processing, of being in the moment and not giving himself away. We, we are seeing Kirk as he is observing a savage universe and how to fit in. Now, does his own experience with his own savage self mm. from the enemy within have anything to do with what Kirk learned from his experience dealing with his savage side, observing his savage side? At the end of The Enemy Within, he says, I've seen a part of myself no man should ever see. And now he is seeing the savage side of his entire crew. Even Spock, in his own way, is savage because of the circumstance. Not wow. genetic. But, but still, is, does that give this Kirk the edge in this universe uh, in, in an effort to behave like a barbarian of sorts, which prevents the mirror universe Spock figuring it out as quickly as the prime universe Spock in his universe. I think that is a totally amazing thought. It hadn't occurred to me at all. Uh, it definitely is exactly what we've been doing on this podcast. Yes. Um, and I, I think what's... Here's, here's my initial reaction, because like I said, I never thought about this. My initial reaction is the first thing is it sort of proves the idea that we've been talking about, which is that these are the same people. Because we know that somewhere inside of Kirk, there is a rapist. You know, right. We know that he is capable of these things. That the, that part, that dark part of his personality is as much a part of who he is as the light part of his personality. Correct. Yep. And so what, what I, my initial reaction to this idea is that it makes him understand where he is more. That is exactly what I was getting to. Yeah. That is exactly my point, is that... That his his experience with his darker self. I remember when we were doing that podcast, we were careful not to refer to that the the alternate Kirk as the evil Kirk. Right. He was the darker Kirk. Uh, but it is still his experience with that that has given him a little bit of an edge in how to act and and sort of keep the facade going that he is not where he belongs. Let's drink a toast to Spock. Only man aboard with the decency to warn you, and he'll die for it. You'll never find another man like him. And again, that's more evidence that this is almost as good a partnership in the mirror universe as it is in ours. Shall I activate the Tantalus field? You'll at least want to monitor him, won't you? And he's like, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Tantalus field, what is that? And she opens up this panel, and what we see is this weird little screen. And she says, I hate this thing. And again, his response is perfect lie. I have no idea what this thing is, but I say it's not, not that so bad. bad. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. It made you captain. How many enemies have you simply wiped out of existence by the touch of a button? Fifty? A hundred? Now I always thought that was funny. The great powerful Captain Kirk who owes everything to some unknown alien scientist and a plundered laboratory. So two things about this. One is, man. This Kirk has killed a lot of people. He sure has. Um, Absolutely. Like like she says, 50, 100, could have been even more than that. Well, and we hear later on that people have a habit of, his enemies have a habit of disappearing. So right. so this is probably how he killed Captain Pike. Oh, right. You know, yeah, like, he used the Tannoy's field. Mm -hmm. He is, he is and, and I'm sure he's done it in sneaky, smart ways so that it doesn't necessarily bring attention back to him. Um, and then this next moment is also fascinating. He says, Well, if you don't take advantage of your opportunities. You don't rise to the command of the starship. I believe she finishes that sentence because her Kirk has said this thing. She's heard him. This is a quote that Kirk says. That's why she can finish his sentence, which is another sign that this is the same person. Right. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she turns on the Tantalus field, and there we see Spock. <laughs> I'll tell you what I wrote. I wrote, there we see Spock looking cool as <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I won't Spock say it that way. sitting there with his arms folded, with the with his you know outfit, the, the outfit, band the beard, he you looks know, amazing. Yeah, he looks badass. That magnificent mind of his. 
but it can't protect him from this. And she puts her finger over a button. I press it. And he dies. And she says, now, and he grabs her hand yep. so forcefully. And she's startled mm-hmm. and says, You really mean it? I think... Kirk's, was she about to kill him, by the way? She was all she was about to touch it. Now, like maybe she was about to kill him. Maybe. But she was certainly motioning like she was. Well, and she certainly believes that he really is going to kill him. And, and and he with his reflex action to protect him, regardless of which universe they're in, just shows you how much that Kirk cares for Spock. And she's shocked by this, because if Spock doesn't kill him, Spock's going to be killed anyway. And he's like, well, I'm going to work everything out so we'll all be fine. And she's just kind of in awe of what he's talking about and asks, And what about me? How does Marlena fit in? How does Marlena want to fit in? And he touches her hair. And I love the way this is staged. She walks away, goes through the door, and just, and she's holding her little drink. Yep. And just as she goes through the door, she turns, turns back, back at him and holds that drink up, and then the door closes. That is as inviting a moment. Yeah, yeah, you know? it sure is, doesn't it? Yep. Scotty here, sir. We have to get out of here within three hours. Spock has orders to kill me unless I complete the military mission. And Scotty's like, no, it's worse than that. It's 30 minutes. 30 minutes, because yep. the universes are moving farther apart. If we miss... We couldn't get out of here in a century. As if the drama wasn't enough right. that you have to get these guys back. First of all, you, we, we have to return our landing party back to their prime universe. Second, we have to prevent this imperial starship enterprise from destroying the Hawkins. Yes. And now there is a race against time. Nothing yep. worked better in, in Star Trek's favor for increasing drama and intensity an edge of your seat excitement than a race against time. Look what happened with the Doomsday Machine. Now we have a big race against time to get back to the Prime Universe with Mirror, Mirror. And there's so many things going on. Spock is an enemy. Uhura is stuck on the bridge. She's going to have to distract Sulu. Kirk, Scotty, and McCoy have to do some sort of engineering stuff. There's, th- I mean, like there's so many things that are happening yep. while this is going on. And Spock is doing some research. Explain computer activity in the engineering section. Our security research is in progress. Who is conducting the research? Our captain and Mr. Scott. And then, as he's doing this, there's a beep. Why are you monitoring my communications, Mr. Sulu? I, I love that the, the, the sound in Spock's voice is so... Dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah. Me- like, sinister. Yeah. And the look on Sulu's face, he's scared. What, what's so great is that I think Sulu is a very developed character for the few moments that he has because he is scared. And I think you can see that he has decided this is an opportunity for him to make a move. For sure. And he knows how dangerous Spock is, but he goes like, I think this will work to our mutual advantage. And I love the performances of both of them. I love that the camera is pushing in on both of them as they have this conversation. My security board has detected extensive use of computer, Mr. Spock. Which, of course, is because Kirk and Scotty are using their communicators on the ship. It's not hard to guess the nature of your order from Starfleet Command. I suggest a connection. He is saying, I'm going to help you. Yeah, let's team up. I know you're going to kill the captain. I'm going to help. Right. The captain suspects he's working on escape or defense. That is a really strategic way of thinking. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, he's going, I know what your, th- I know what your orders are. I know what you're thinking about. I, too, am thinking about what the captain is thinking about. I'm the chief of security, which gives me a lot of power and a lot of people, and I can be an asset to you. That is my concern. Correct. It's your play. I hope you succeed. Because the order would fall on me next. And you know how Captain Kirk's enemies have a habit of disappearing. Which is the Tantalus field. Yes, right. Um, and I love how that's, how that's how good writing happens, is we hear pieces of the information from Marlena. Now we get another piece from Sulu. And then Spock's line is chilling in how scary it is. I do not want to command the Enterprise. But if it should befall me, I suggest you remember that my operatives would avenge my death. And what he says after that, he takes a pause. And some of them are Vulcans. <laughs> In a split second, it makes you wonder what Vulcans, not just Spock, but what the planet 
Vulcan is like in the mirror universe. Well, and how damn dangerous Vulcans are if they're freed from their kind of logical discipline. Like, like, are the Vulcans a little bit closer to the Romulans? Yeah. Like, I mean, clearly Spock, judging by his demeanor, is still is still thinking very logically. His his he's very dialed back. He's very reserved, just like the Spock is yeah. in the Prime Universe. But are the Vulcans in the Mirror Universe more savage? If not emotional, but certainly more savage. And like dangerous, yeah. Dangerous, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And you certainly, Sulu's reaction <laughs> it says... He's scared. He's scared. <laughs> uh, we're back in the captain's cabin. The door opens, and there is Marlena. There is Marlena wearing a different outfit yes. than the sort of bikini uniform that she yeah. was wearing. So what happened was, on the fourth day of filming Mirror Mirror, Barbara Luna was sent home with strep throat oh. and 103 degrees. Oh, my God. She was extremely contagious. Yeah. And nobody wanted her to get anyone else oh, yeah. sick. So she was sent home. And she had to be called back later to film a pickup of this scene, mm. which culminates in a kiss with Captain Kirk, right. William Shatner. So nine days after they were finished filming Mirror Mirror, which that date was August 2nd, they finished filming the episode on August 2nd. On August 11th, when they were well into production of The Deadly Years, which was the next episode to be filmed after Mirror Mirror, Barbara Luna was called back and they did a pickup. And this is where she had noticeably been much thinner mm. because of all the, late, the weight oh. that she lost while she was thin. So Bill Tice, the costume designer, put a different outfit on her so she wouldn't look no- so noticeable that she had lost all the weight. But so, yes, nine days after the end of the filming of mm. Mirror Mirror, they did this pickup, and uh, William Shatner had to wear the uh, alternate Mirror Universe Captain shirt again, and they, mm. had, they had the kiss, and uh, uh, apparently it was worth the wait. Well, and this outfit is, if anything... I mean, it is it is quite a sexy outfit. Yes, for it, sure. It really is. And this is very clear, like, what this relationship is. I'm afraid I'm a little out of practice. Maybe that's what happened to us, huh? What's that line mean? I'm a little out of practice. Maybe that's what's happened to us. Well, I think that he got tired of her. Yeah, I think their relationship is on the decline. Right, I agree. Completely. And she is, and, and so again, that's just a tiny detail that adds more to these characters mm-hmm. and more to what's going on. It's very hard for a working officer to shine as a woman every minute, and you demand perfection. That means that she has not been living up to his to to, to mirror Kirk's expectations on some levels. But Kirk's response to this, he goes, "I've never seen perfection, but no woman could come closer to it." He is charming in both universes. And, and, <laughs> sh- and she says, I remember when you used to talk that way, which means he hasn't been talking that way in a long time. And he says, I still do, but you're right. They, they, yeah. I, their, their relationship was on the skits. And she says, prove it, which is basically a, you know, an invitation to advance the situation a little further. Watch Shatner's moment here, because he kind of shakes his head and goes, I got to go. I've got to go. <laughs> you could totally see the... I can't believe I have to walk out on sex with this beautiful woman <laughs> who, you know, who I have a fake relationship with or I have a, my mirror self as a relationship, but I have to go. Yeah, he's like, I got to go. <laughs> Typical okay. guy. And she thinks that he's rejecting her. That's what she feels. And she says, as he's trying to leave, Well, I guess it's over. And then it gets, man, she says, there's some other commander that will take me temporarily. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. made that quite clear. So it is very clear in this universe that women, and as I said, maybe men, that there are sexual ways that people advance and there are relationships that are common and are open to some degree Right. in this universe. I'll call a yeoman to help me with my things. You don't have to do that. Are you feeling sorry for me? Do I see hesitation in your eyes about anything? And I love, I love what comes next. She says, I want one thing, Captain. Transfer me. On the Enterprise, I am humiliated. On another ship, I can hunt fresh game. I've got my rank, don't I? Like, he could take away her rank, too. Mm -hmm. I've been a captain's woman, and I like it. I'll be one again if I have to go through every officer in the fleet. This next moment is fascinating, because he says, you could, which she takes to mean that he's basically calling her 
um, a not nice thing. Right, what, right. What does it mean to go through every officer in right, the fleet? Right, right. But she goes to slap him. He, he says, hang on. You know, I simply meant you can be anything you want to be. Yeah. Right. Which is much more the prime universe. Like, you, you know, you, you could be any... Because she doesn't see that. And there's long kiss. It's been a long time since you've kissed me like that. You're a stranger. Now, in the earlier version of the outlines and the stories... It's that kiss that makes, in that case, Anna, Mm -hmm. because that was originally her name. That's how she knows that this is not her Kirk, because of the kiss. Gotcha. Makes perfect sense. Am I your woman? And again, this is great writing, because, of course, she's not this Kirk's woman. He just met her. You're the captain's woman, until he says you're not. Which is a great line that that is perfectly true in, in all the different realities. And he exits... And she opens up the Thanos field and is watching him as he walks down the corridors, which is great, great touch. And that made me think, okay, maybe it was the kiss in the finished version Mm. that makes Marlena think, that was weird. Oh, I definitely think she's going, this is really weird. She, she, Well, she's definitely going, this is really weird, because suddenly he's showing her a level of interest and attention, and and, uh, certainly... uh, compassion that he never showed before yep but when he kisses her that's when she starts to like like follow up on him and that's when she uses the tantalus field to check him out and yeah. start following him i i think I, I think there it's not a criticism of this episode that i think is pretty much perfect but the her figuring things out there could have been a little bit more of because yeah. she has all the clues now and I, and i gotta say i think that one can probably notice the difference between what it's like to kiss someone the first time and what it's like to kiss someone who has kissed you many, many, many sure, times. Sure, absolutely. So that I, I, I think her going, and between that and the Hawkins and Mr. Spock and Chekhov and all the, I mean, there's a lot. Marlena has maybe more evidence than anybody else that this guy is different. Aura. Yes, Captain. Scottish signal should be coming through any moment now. You know what to do. I've got a pretty good idea, sir. And Scotty's in a Jeffrey's tube, sends the signal to Uhura, Watch Nichelle Nichols as she sort of settles herself in the moment before. And then she heads over to Sulu, leans in on him, and says, You are very persistent, Mr. Sulu. The game has rules. You're ignoring them. I protest, and you come back. You didn't come back. As she's like tapping on his yeah, nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great scene, and both actors are terrific. Yeah. Now you're making sense i was getting bored and right at that moment as his attention is entirely on her yes that light blinks on his panel of course this isn't the time any time's a good time and now that she's done her job now she's trying to pull away and he moves in and man she slaps him she slaps him good like yeah. he goes back it's on a that good chair. back fist Ugh. i'm afraid i changed my mind you take a lot of chances, Lieutenant. So do you, mister. And what does Uhura do? She pulls her knife. Yeah. So do you, mister. So do you. What's so great is, like, you go, man, she's really good. Mm-hmm. Like, she really had, could do a lot of interesting things. And yes, is this the classic, a woman uses sex to, you know, yes, this is a total trope. Uh, it is. But this is also 1967, so it isn't such an overused trope at that moment. Right. And... It's great. It's a great, great scene. I, I love what the security guards are doing in the background. I literally see my notes. Right, right. So, so in in the background, the the two security guards leaning against the the turbo lift door. Mm-hmm. They're 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 more casual. They're like they get they're resting their hands on their their hips and they're they're smirking. They're totally watching this whole thing go down. And they're they're loving every minute of it. And then when Sulu gets up, they stand at attention yep. again. Yep, it's great. And again, was that necessary for our show? Not at all. But it's a total little detail that's amazing. Um, We're in the transporter room. Kirk is doing something, and Spock comes in. Please restrict your movements, Captain. And and what Kirk's play is really interesting. Are you going to shoot me now, Spock? I thought I had it until dawn. Spock kind of goes through everything that's been going on and says, I want to know why. And Kirk just says, shoot, you're wasting Wasting your time. time. Mm-hmm. 
Why does he say to shoot him? Does he think Spock's going to shoot him? No, he does not. I don't think he does either. But I also think that if Spock shoots Kirk, Kirk goes, McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty could probably get away. Right. Because right. all the focus is on me. But I, I don't think but for I don't a think moment did, yeah, I don't that think Kirk thought that Spock was really going to shoot him. I shall not waste time with you. You're too inflexible, too disciplined once you've made up your mind. Which means that this Kirk is really impressive. This Kirk in this universe is just as impressive as our Kirk. For sure. But Dr. McCoy has a plenitude of human weaknesses. Sentimental, soft. You may not tell me what I want to know, but he will. So if what Spock is saying about the McCoy in the mirror universe is that he is not unlike the McCoy in the prime universe. I mean, sentimental, soft, yeah. but still, of course, there's going to be a savage side because he is serving right. aboard an imperial starship. Um, but and I'm going. So, what is Spock planning on doing, by the way? Oh well, what do you mean? To McCoy, how is he going to get this information? Well, maybe from uh, the way that he actually does get the information from him. But I don't think he's thinking that far ahead of using oh, the I mind did. melt yet. No, I don't think he's using the mind melt. I think he's going to use the agonizer. Oh, there you go. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, he's, totally is. He's going to torture McCoy until right. McCoy tells him what he wants to know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're in sick bay. Kirk enters with Spock, and Spock looks around and goes, of course. The entire landing party. And he's got the phaser, and he thinks he's in control, and he goes to talk to the doctor, and Kirk starts to move and disarms him. And this fight scene is awesome. <laughs> I, By the way, watching this fight scene, I went, oh, this is, I see why Scott was scared of Mr. Spock. See? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Spock like is holding off four people. And by the way, even though there's uh, stuntmen, yeah. Yeah, even though there's stuntman, but I love the over the head mm -hmm. uh, point of view of, of the fight from the Raptors shooting down on the sick base scene. Uh, but I think it is a great scene and I love that Spock holds holds all of them off until Kirk well, takes the uh, And there's there's great there's great throws in it, like a lot of really great throws, and you see just how strong Spock is. This is what it should be, I think, is this is how dangerous Spock is. And mm -hmm. sometimes he's that dangerous in other episodes, and sometimes he's not. Uh, but this is really, really scary. And there are a couple of moments that are great. A, that he just is throwing one of them after another. The other one is Kirk gets him up against the wall, and then he does the weirdest headbutt, which is a lifting up your head under Spock's chin, right. hits Spock, and there is a look from Leonard Nimoy when his head turns back of just sheer animal rage. I, uh, exactly my point. Yeah. When I was watching this as a kid, certainly for the first of many times when I was younger, I was afraid of Spock. Yeah. And this episode has so many moments that say why, and, and this this is another scene, and there's still another one coming up. Well, and the feeling is like, no, this is angry Spock, and angry Spock will take out all four of them. <laughs> Except that Uhura hands Kirk a skull, which he breaks over Spock's head. If that hadn't happened, they're all wiped out. Right. How much time, Scotty? Oh, hardly 15 minutes, sir. The, the field density between the two universes is starting to close very fast. And McCoy, because he's McCoy, says, Help me get him on the table. Well, come on, help me get him on the table. He'll die without immediate treatment. Now it's like we've added another thing. Like, we have ticking clocks. We have Spock's about to die. We have all these things going on at the same time. And we talk about, we hit another, this is another little plant that there's a, a delay in the transporter so that somebody can operate the transporter and get onto the platform. Come on, McCoy. You're taking a chance on not getting back home. And I like McCoy tells Scotty to shut up. You want me to stop, Jim? And Kirk smiles. I'll only take a minute. He is very much like our own Mr. Spock, isn't he? You've got that minute. The other thing I think that's going on is it's A, we want to save Spock. I also think he's smiling because in all of this violence, in all of this evil, scary, dark universe, McCoy is going to be compassionate. McCoy is still McCoy. Yep, absolutely. It doesn't matter who it is. And, you know, we've been making the jokes about no first aid from McCoy. Here, this is the, this is the guy that we see, like, in Star Trek VI, who's like, no, I can save his life. And by the way, I just want to say, you know, all the times that we sort of, like, made fun of McCoy for not being the greatest doctor, here's, here's the comeuppance. Here's the moment of truth when McCoy actually does yeah. doctor work to yeah. save Mr. Spock. Well, and it's so funny because I, I, I said, I think, in our last episode that I was going to stop making this joke. Mm -hmm. There have been so many people on Twitter, on Facebook that said, please don't stop making yeah, this joke. Yeah, they love it. <laughs> yeah, so. It's a hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
it, it, it'll come back. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if it's funny, it'll come back. <laughs> uh, but right now, he's working to save Spock, and we're like, oh my God, the, they're running out of time. Spock is going to die. And if things couldn't get any worse. In walks in Mr. Sulu, Sulu with three security guards, and they're, they're all having their phasers drawn, mm-hmm. but Sulu draws his knife. Mr. Spock has orders to kill you, Captain. You will succeed, apparently. You will also appear to have killed him after a fierce battle. Regrettable, but it will leave me in command. George Takei. Is there a better episode for George Takei? I know everyone always says, like, like uh, The Naked Time is such a great showcase for him. And it absolutely is. And that was at a time in the beginning of the first season when he was he was getting a lot more attention, like we pointed out before on Enterprise Incidents. You know, first season was really, really good to Sulu. But this one, I feel like it's more fun because not only does he get such a, such a substantial role as Sulu and and obviously seems to be having a great time with it, but again, like we pointed out earlier in this podcast, everyone gets a moment or two to really, really, really shine. So I will answer your question in, a, in an odd way, which is I think absolutely the Naked Time is the greatest episode for Sulu. Mm-hmm. This is the greatest episode for George Takei. Oh, is, all right. Yeah. As it, In terms of Sulu's character and him shining for who he is, Naked Time has so much stuff. Sure. But for George Takei to have a great time playing a different actual character, he's killing it in this. And he is, you can tell, he's having so much fun. So by the end of the, the third act, there were a couple of other changes throughout Act 2 and Act 3 from earlier versions. For one thing... Just like uh, like I pointed out before, they don't have phasers right. in the alternate oh, universe. Oh, good point. So Kirk tries to create a phaser. Hmm. But when Anna, you know, before it was right. Marlena, yeah. she was Anna. And when Anna has that kiss with Kirk, that's when she knows that this Kirk is not her husband. And she accuses Kirk of being a Tharn spy, Tharn being the villains. The, the villains, right. In, in the, the alternate yeah. timeline or the uh, the mirror universe. That we're losing to. Uh, but it is Spock who mind melds with Kirk, discovers that Kirk is from a parallel universe who has knowledge of superior technology oh. and has Kirk help him build a phaser so the Federation do not have to surrender and are able to defeat the Tharn. You know what? That's a perfectly good episode of Star Trek. Honestly, like there's all sorts of interesting ideas there. It's not a, It's not this. It's not this. And again, the one thing that was very, very different from the earlier versions was that the all, the parallel universe was not savage and evil and sinister. Right. Well, and this is the thing. That one doesn't ask any moral questions. This one does ask profound sure. moral questions. It does. And what we're going to get to in Act 4 and the big speech, which obviously we're going to talk about, that that is critical to all of Star Trek, that speech. You know what I mean? Just like uh, we're not going to kill today. Like all, It's one of the, or risk is our business. Like That is one of the formative things, and that speech cannot exist in this original story. Absolutely. And we come back in Act 4 in the same spot, and here's what I think. This is what I think is really good writing and really good filmmaking. In really good filmmaking, you plant things perfectly, and then... They're planted so well that the audience, by the time the payoff is coming, they've forgotten it. My guess is that if you were watching this for the first time, and certainly you as a six-year-old kid watching it for the first time, you've forgotten about the Tantalus field. You've forgotten that Marlena was watching Kirk as he left in the corridor. You're just like, oh my God, how are these guys going to get out of this? What an excellent perspective, Steve Morris, because even when you watch this, whether it's the first time as a six-year-old, or the 300th time as a 53-year-old, I still forget in some ways that Marlena Moreau is standing by ready to push that button three, but not four times. And you're right. It's like you just saw it. You just saw Marlena threaten to use it on Spock. 
But here we are in just And the you next saw act. her watch Kirk walk away. So yeah. she, you know she's watching Kirk. But you still are not thinking about it at that moment yeah. in the in the sick bay when Sulu was standing there with the other guys. That's what makes a satisfying planet payoff. And it is so the moment the first guard disappears, <laughs> just like, oh my God. And yeah. then and Sulu looks, and then the second guard disappears, and then the third, and now poor Sulu, who should have brought a phaser, <laughs> um, only has a <laughs> knife. And I and I even love this tiny, tiny bit of of combat tactics which is Kirk backs up behind the table, backs up behind the bed so that when Sulu thrusts his hands over that bed and that allows Kirk to disarm the old karate chop to the back. To the neck, <laughs> right, right. And right. he's out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing is, so so you had the changeling in which uh, uh, Nomad zapped away two red shirts mm -hmm. at a time. Uh, so, you, you know, we got rid of four red shirts in the changeling. Uh, actually five if you include Scotty, but they brought him back to life. So then in the apple, you know, you see four red shirts go one by one in spectacular fashion, I might add. Mm -hmm. Each of those red shirts died a completely different, very violent and painful death. And now here we are in Mirror Mirror, where you have just like, boom, one fell swoop. We get rid of three red shirts. So like, this is like the peak period of that cliche about the red shirts that, that has been a running joke now for 55 years. It's funny because since we've always gone, well, security is always in the red shirts, except that in Mirror Mirror, personal security guards are in those blue sort of tunics. Right. Is that if those guys had been wearing red shirts, we got another two guys that get killed yeah, that's um, right. earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, but fortunately, they weren't wearing red shirts, so they don't count. That's um, true. But, but OK. And, and again, it's like right out of one tough situation into another because they've only got 10 minutes. And McCoy says, I can't let him die, Joe. Look, you get out of the transporter room, make sure it's clear. I'll be there in five minutes. And he sends everyone away. And this is to your point. Everybody gets a great moment. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is McCoy being full McCoy. I, I am willing to sacrifice everything to save a life. Not only does he have a great moment where he is willing to sacrifice himself to save not just a life, but the life of Mirror Spock, who is very much like our own Mr. Spock. But it's almost like McCoy heard Steve Morris pointing out his shortcomings yeah. as a doctor. <laughs> and, and in one fell swoop, he makes up for it, not with a, a great moment as a doctor, but a great moment as a character. And uh, it, it is a great moment. But while he is working on Spock, Spock kind of comes to, yep. grabs his arm, and McCoy is pretty scared, I would say. Right? Full, full deer in the headlights at this moment. Totally deer in the headlights. To, to, to the point, by the way, where I almost, I've always kind of gone, wait, is Spock already mind melding him a tiny bit? Because he looks dazed almost. Well, you're right. I think the deer in the headlights look on McCoy's face is, is first of all, extremely accurate. But also, I just think, I think he is scared. And as, oh, yeah. okay, so, so as Spock is is holding McCoy's arm forcefully and he is pushing McCoy step by step back to the bulkhead. Why did the captain let me live? Then he takes his hand and he puts it on McCoy's face. Our minds are merging, Doctor. Our minds are one. You know, I pointed out at certain points during this episode, Steve, how when they first beam aboard the ISS Enterprise and you see Spock with the goatee, I was scared and when right. you uh, scared of Spock and, and, you know, when you see how, how, uh, sort of sinister and calculating and very much in control Spock is like, that was another thing that, that intimidated me about him. But when I was a kid and I saw Spock give McCoy the mind melt, my, keep in mind, this is the first time I've ever seen a yeah. mind melt. So I didn't know what he was doing, but that was another reason sure. that for like the longest time I was pretty intimidated by Spock. So how long did this fear of Spock last? Well, that's a great question, Steve, because, you know, you're talking about the time when, when I was getting into Star Trek for the very, very first time, and they were showing these episodes in production order. So it wasn't long after Mirror Mirror where I saw an episode like Return to Tomorrow, Mm. where Sargon's people took over Kirk and Spock and, you know, Diana Muldaur. So, so, so that was another element 
that that kind of scared me. And you know that that sort of feeling of being intimidated by Spock lasted for quite a while until I started to see the series in rotation, rotation, right. and then I was like, oh, okay, he's you know, don't nothing to be afraid of here. It's okay. <laughs> were you, were you? A, I'm curious. Were you a comic book reader? At oh, this time? sure was. Yeah, you bet. Amazing Spider Man and. Fantastic Four and X Men, sure. Why do you ask? Because I think for me, like I never, I was never scared of Spock. That never occurred to me. And I think maybe because for me, maybe part of it, I was just thinking was, well, there are a lot of comic books where you see the evil version of somebody. You know what I mean? Oh, I see. Like, and I was wondering if I was sort of more used to that on some because it was just like, well, that is a different version of Spock. You know, like it never was, and, and because I so loved superpowers, that the fact that he had superpowers just made him cooler. Yeah, me. yeah, um, yeah. Um, one thing I want to point out, like we just talked about how, you know, Takei is making a meal of playing this evil version of Sulu. The thing that amazes me so much about Nimoy, and I maybe I can point it out here, is that it's one thing to do something completely different like Sulu is doing. Mm-hmm. What Nimoy is doing is variations on a theme. He is 10 or 15 percent different is that when he goes to do this mind meld, and first of all, up to this point, we've always said, hey, I think I better use the Vulcan mind meld. Are you sure you want to use the Vulcan mind meld? We don't need to do that now. As soon as he lifts up his hand, we've been watching the show. We go, oh my God, he's going to do the mind meld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you listen to how he does it, it is more aggressive. It is slightly more intense and forceful than the way he's done it before. Absolutely it is. You're right. But it's only 10%. It's only 15%. That's what so impresses me about Nimoy is that, particularly throughout this episode, he's still Spock. Like, mm-hmm. Sulu's totally a different person. That's a good point. But Spock is still Spock. He's just turned it 10 or 15 or 20%. That's really advanced acting. What you just pointed out with the 10 or 15% of just how he's, he's, he's tilted that way sums up what we've been trying to sort of nail about our assertion of Spock in this episode. You know, the question that we had near the beginning of the first act when we said, you know, what's the, what are the differences here between the, between the two Spocks? Are they different? And then you pointed out like, are, is it, are these people genetically different from, from the prime universe? You know, this all ties into, to that earlier part of our conversation here. And I think that what you just said now about Nimoy sums it up just perfectly is that he's still our Spock, but he's just a little, he's 15% different. It's because of just the circumstance right. that he's in, the circumstance that they certainly grew up in, that he was exposed to. But but you're right. Compared to the other ways up to this point in the production order in which he used the mind meld, like when you, when you saw him use it for the first time on Simon Van Gelder and Dagger of the Mind, and then, you know, you see him use it on Nomad, you see him use it on the, the Horda, you know, you see him use it on the guard, you know, to uh, let them out in, of the, of the, uh, the jail right. cell in uh, A Taste of Armageddon. But there's, there's something very aggressive and sinister and yep. forceful, and that he's using that aggression and force on a beloved character that apparently even in this universe is is a little softer and has uh, succumbs to a platitude of human weaknesses, as Spock pointed out. Two, two things about this. So one is, well, you know what just occurred to me is that in every case that we talked about, the Horde of Van Gelder, all these ones, you it seems very clear that Spock would never use this to hurt somebody, even if it's someone that is uh, an antagonist, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like that guard outside the cell in A Taste of Armageddon, that guy's fine. You know what I mean? Good point. This Spock, I don't think we know that. Excellent point. Excellent point. And who knows? Uh, he in, might in have hurt universe, people with this. He yeah. might have hurt people. Because as we will see in the second half of our deep dives on the original series, and really the next half, because we are going to do 40 episodes after this, right. you know, when we see in episodes like uh, Spectre of the Gun, you know, he mm-hmm. uses the mind meld to save his crew members right and at the end of requiem for methuselah after kirk is heartbroken you know spock uses the mind meld on kirk to make him forget about his heartbreak does spock use the vulcan mind meld in in this mirror universe for those same priorities and outcomes and goals uh i'm gonna say i don't think so i I think he's used it on a far more aggressive way in other ways well and remember what he said to sulu some of my operatives are vulcans 
and I, Sue I was think scared. that ties into this thing. <laughs> yep. Here's the other big thought I just had. Mm-hmm. So we just said that part of Nimoy's greatness is his ability to make subtle changes. Who is he paired with? He's paired with an actor who's the total opposite. Shatner is a person who makes huge changes. And so, and and it just suddenly went like, oh, that's part of the secret sauce is you have this guy who's the rock who can, who, who with just little tiny things can show you changes. And you have this guy with this massive range who's going to be big and small and silly and all these things that he's going to do. And it's the two of them together that really, really work. Each one without the other, not so good. That's another excellent perspective because if you look at the way that the Spocks are different between the two universes, you, like you said, like you pointed out perfectly, it's that 15%. Whereas the Kirks in the Huge. different universe are like, like polar opposites, like yeah. uh, like a total like 180 you know, uh, from, from the prime universe to the mirror universe Kirk. Uh, but then Spock is probably the most uh the the subtlest changes because he's still so close to the prime spock and it's just that 15 percent because of just these these circumstances but excellent excellent points but we're now in the transporter room and of course who is there but marlena take me with you okay i'm sorry our power is balanced for four there's no guarantee that we'll make it with five but there are only three of you. One is coming. And that's when she takes the phaser out from behind her back. She wants out of this universe. Now, what what is it? Okay, if she said that she was a captain's woman and she likes it, okay, and she's threatening threatening Kirk to go to the other captain, what was it that she suddenly decided, I want to out? Was it because she was actually scared for her life to be in this universe? Was it because she heard this potential of what it was like for women in the prime universe? Or was she more in love with prime Kirk than mirror Kirk? Well, I think this is, this is why I think this is a really well-constructed episode Mm -hmm. because what did we deduce about her relationship with mirror Kirk in the scene when she was with our Kirk? We deduced that their relationship was on the skids, that it right. was heading down, that it was that she, before our Kirk shows up, was already like, I might be out. And she's contemplating, and we've heard her whole, we understand where she is in her life. She says, well, there's this other guy that said he'll, he'll take me. And the way she says it, you know, he's made that clear enough. That doesn't mean she likes him. It doesn't sound like she likes him at all. And she can't be on the Enterprise if she's not with her Kirk because she will be humiliated and that she's going to have to fight her way to be a captain's woman again. Her prospects are terrible. Right. You know? Uh, Right. There you go. There's the answer. And then, and then you add to that that this Kirk kissed her and talked to her the way her Kirk did at the beginning of the relationship. And now she, we know that she watched every single discussion, every moment with our Kirk up until this time so she knows oh he actually is a different person they are from a different place i think it is a hundred percent makes perfect sense why she would be doing what she's doing. yeah absolutely you're you're totally right um and and again this is where we get everybody gets their moment because she this is a great moment for marlena and then who is going to disarm her from that phaser is uhura yes it's just and, and what's so great about this episode is the stuff you get to Sulu or Ahura or Scotty doesn't take away from Kirk and Spock. You know what I mean? Right. It's really it, a perfect, perfect balance. Yeah. And and again, you know, like I pointed out earlier, the only other episode where I could see just such a such a perfect balance with making making this cast a true ensemble was Doomsday Machine. You know, the only problem with that episode is you don't have Uhura and Chekhov. But uh but yes. And I so, think this one's better. I think this for one's sure. Yeah. yeah, I agree completely. I mean In terms he, of the ensemble, I'm not necessarily saying it's a better episode, but in terms of the stuff the ensemble gets to do. You know, th- this this episode and and I would say the next one that I, that I look at as being like a, just a true ensemble is Trouble with Tribbles. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Sulu is not in Trouble with Tribbles, but Chekhov mm-hmm. certainly is. Right. Uh, but but I just love that Uhura just steps up, you know, grabs her, twists her arm, grabs the phaser and like puts Marlena down. <laughs> well, and, and again, how often are we out of the firing, a frying pan into the fire? It's like 
you know, Spock has just captured us and then we finally knock out Spock and then there's Sulu and then we get rid of Sulu and there's Marlena with a phaser. And now we get rid of Marlena with a phaser and we find out that they've turned off the power. And now the only way to do the trans that they had this thing where they had like a, you know, a delay. So someone could turn on the transporters and get on the platform. That doesn't exist anymore. If they switch to auxiliary, which means somebody is going to have to stay behind. And then Scotty says, I'll stay captain. Get to the transporter chamber. And the first time, and I would say, I'm going to say the only time that I certainly know, and I think I know, (laughs) this is the only time where Scotty refers to his captain. He says, Jim. And it's such a great moment. That's an order, Scotty. And he says it in a way where he's saying, hey, you know, thank you. I appreciate the sentiment but get on the transporter platform and get back to the prime universe. What's so great about it is that Scotty is such a creature of the military system in a way and so comfortable in his role in relationship to the captain. But he knows and Kirk knows, and they each know that the other knows that they are friends. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's only in this moment where there's a massive sacrifice about to happen that he's like, no, I'm going to call him Jim. It's great. The other one, the other thing I think is like is Kirk could go. Listen, Scotty, I totally get it, but I have this hot woman here in this universe, <laughs> so you don't. <laughs> like I got a little bit more stuff to stay for <laughs> than you do. Um, but of course, right at that moment, there's McCoy with Spock. Spock is is has his phaser on McCoy, and that that music sting. I cut the transported power. It was necessary to delay your beam out until I could arrive. The look on Kirk's face is like one of horror, like, oh, man, well, we're busted. And then in a split second, it's a moment of pride. Yep. It's a moment of pride. He lets McCoy go. McCoy gets on the transporter platform. And Kirk looks at him and says, You're a man of integrity in both universes, Mr. Spock. Everything that Kirk had suspected about Spock in the mirror universe in one fell swoop was absolutely confirmed that Spock wanted to be there to beam him out and get his captain back, but he wanted to make sure the prime landing party got back to their universe safely. Integrity, integrity indeed. Well, and I think he wanted to be there. You know what I mean? Yep. Like he wanted to be there to actually face this other captain in some way. Spock also sees that this Captain Kirk is a man of integrity. That feeling of integrity, that admiration of integrity that they have for each other, we see at this point is mutual. Mm-hmm. Sure. A- and and I think that that Kirk, you know, there's that moment in the corridor when Spock basically threatens Kirk and says, uh, I trust that you were aware of the reverse in terms of being mm-hmm. a formidable enemy. Yeah. Um, and then Spock walks off and Kirk is looking at him like he admires him. Mm-hmm. So I think that Kirk saw the integrity in Spock before Spock saw the integrity in Kirk and Spock had to catch up with him. And this is the moment when they meet, they, they are meeting at the exact same point of this mutual admiration they have for each other. And that was another reason why Mira Spock wanted to see Prime Kirk on his way out. I, I agree. And it's funny, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna put this thought forward, but I, it would be like a really long discussion. But, but like <laughs> what occurs, but I'm suddenly going, it's like, well, is the Mirror Kirk a man of integrity in the Mirror Universe? And it depends on how you define the term integrity. Exactly. It's like, if integrity is what we would call moral, then no. But if integrity is uh, sticking to a code that is the expected and desirable code within a culture, then maybe the answer is yes. And I think in his relationship, the Kirk-Spock relationship in the mirror universe, they have a good relationship for that universe, even though they're doing a bunch of stuff that's really horrible in our opinion. Well, I Um, think like you pointed out, Steve, the relationship that the mirror Kirk and the mirror Spock have, it it has been a successful relationship. But the the friendship isn't quite there like it is in the prime universe. I think they never had City on the Edge of Forever. I, you know? And I definitely never had a mock time. Yeah. 
uh, or, or this side of paradise, probably. Right. Like, like those, those things probably didn't happen, but they probably did kick some ass in a whole bunch of different situations together <laughs> and knew that the, uh, they had, cause, cause and this is the thing that, that uh, I'm sorry for the digression, but like, is that people go, well, if someone is bad, they're just all bad. And that's not a good way to look at things because Spock has Kirk's back. And Kirk has Spock's back in the mirror universe. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we couldn't be here. The society couldn't exist, you know? That's great points. And he says, look, you got two minutes and 10 seconds and get on the transporter. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> our guys could just get on the transporter and Spock would beam them out. But that is not what's going to happen because we are going to have one of the great Kirk speeches. I mean, it's just, it's so great. By that time, I have something to say. And can you imagine, Scott, like you are two minutes and 10 seconds away from being trapped for the rest of your life in this really scary universe. And you go, I'm going to use up just about every one of those seconds because I want to say something. How long before the Hulk and prediction of collective revolt is realized? Did they make a prediction? I will look back to find it. I don't think it's in this episode. Oh, well, no, they didn't. So I think it was something that was maybe cut out. Where oh, they said, oh, oh, your your empire is not going to last forever. It's going to fall. It's, you know, it's already showing signs of strain or something like that. And, but, um, but, but Kirk says, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what will eventually happen? And Spock says the empire will be overthrown, of course. Mm-hmm. Like it's just inevitable right. that the empire will be overthrown because of what Kirk says earlier. He says conquest is easy. Control is not. And Spock is – basically agreeing with something that Kirk said earlier is that, yeah, uh, captain, you're right. Uh, control is not, and eventually the empire will be overthrown. Well, and so far in human history, all the empires have been, you know, the Rem- Roman empire is overthrown the, every single one, the, the largest empire in the history of the world is probably the shortest live, which is the Mongol empire that, you know, it's only a hundred plus years and it starts to fall down. Um, so it makes sense that they're saying this. And then I, I'm so fascinated by this speech because of what it isn't. So what Kirk says is... The logic of waste, Mr. Spark. The waste of lives, potential, resources, time. I submit to you that your empire is illogical because it cannot endure. I submit that you are illogical to be a willing part of it. I want to pause on this just for a moment because what's interesting to me about this speech is what he doesn't say. How do you mean? There is nothing moral about this speech. He doesn't say your empire is evil. He doesn't say you're killing people. You're subjugating people. You're seeking power. You have assassination. He doesn't go into anything ethical. What he says is your empire is wasteful. That is a really, to me, profound statement actually about good and evil is that evil is wasteful. It's That's not, a great it, point. You're it's right. It's not that it's it's not just that it's wrong, which of course it is, but it doesn't work that well. You're right. First, I mean, you, you you don't hear Kirk go into some tirade pointing out all of the different ways in which the empire is evil and sinister and violent and oppressive. Uh, what he says ultimately, and and what he says ultimately is, you're wasting your time. Yeah. And uh, someone so brilliant and logical like yourself must know that wasting time is illogical. So what he is doing here, what he is doing with Spock is the same tactic that he used on Nomad in the Changeling. He is using logic logic to defeat a person who thinks a lot like a computer, but he's not thinking like a computer here. But he is using logic to make his point, and he's using logic on... Someone who has devoted his life in both universes to logic. And it's brilliant. It's brilliantly played. And this is the thing I just want to point it out, is that a, a culture that is based on assassination is inherently wasteful. Because it means that someone with great potential, like Chekhov, might be tortured to death. And then you waste his potential. Mm-hmm. Is that? And I think one of the big things, uh, you know the term zero-sum game and non-zero-sum games? No. They're the weirdest terms and they're so they sound so bizarre. But the basic meaning is a zero sum game is where you and I have a limited resources. So let's say we got a, you and I ordered a pizza and there are eight slices. Well, if the more slices I take, the less you get. Right. So if I take six slices, you only got two. That is a zero sum game. A non zero sum game is something where 
it's not about limited resources. So if it was like, I can make 10 pizzas by myself and you can make 10 pizzas by yourself. If we work together, we might not make 20 pizzas. We might make 30 pizzas and they might be better pizzas. Right. So we're not in direct competition with each other. And a lot of times we think of things as zero sum games. In other words, if you win, I lose and Mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. But in fact there, if we could work together, if we could find some compromise, then we actually would all benefit more. Um, and thinking of the universe as trying to find non-zero sum games is part of what Kirk is talking about. The mirror universe is all zero sum. If you win, I lose. Right. As opposed to the Federation, which is we're so much stronger together than we are fighting against each other. Right. We're stronger with you than without you. Exactly. Um, and Spock is going, you have one minute and 23 seconds. Yeah. Spock is like, you know, here's Kirk like really like launching into his yeah. last ditch attempt to – to influence Spock and to make him see the light. And Spock, Spock is seeing like that, yeah, well, he's actually right here, but he's just counting down. You have, you know, counting down. You have a minute left, basically. Well, and I don't think Kirk has been persuasive at this moment. Spock is kind of going, come on, you got to go. You have one minute and 23 seconds. If change is inevitable, predictable, beneficial, doesn't logic demand that you be a part of it? And I love the way Kirk, he, he, the way he, in, he says demand, yeah. he, he, he really emphasizes the word, doesn't logic demand that you be a part of it. Like it's just like laying it all out there. He's put it all, putting it all on the table because this point prime Kirk has nothing to lose. Absolutely. He's gone. He's literally leaving the universe in less than a minute at this point. <laughs> and I love this pair, the pairing of these two lines. One man cannot summon the future. But one man can change the present. That's a great re- call and response. I know the writer spent a long time trying to figure out that word summon. That was a really tough word to find when he was writing this. And Kirk says, he gives his, his statement. Be the captain of this enterprise, Mr. Spock. Find a logical reason for sparing the Hawkins and make it stick. Push till it gives. You know, I got to say that, that, you know, you're asking like who the writer is, given that the final polish on this, this final draft teleplay was written by Gene Kuhn. I think it's pretty safe to say who, who wrote this speech. It, it's funny that the guy that really can write some of the most highfalutin, the most like powerful uh, moral statements is also the guy that writes the Kunisms at the ends of the episodes. <laughs> yeah. um, here's my question for you. He just said, be the captain of the Enterprise. Did Prime Kirk just tell Mirror Spock to assassinate Mirror Kirk? I don't think he said to assassinate him. How's he going to be the captain of the Enterprise? I don't think our Kirk, I don't think Prime Kirk would suggest to Mirror Spock to assassinate his captain. I think what he said was to overthrow his captain. He said he he ends his speech in every revolution. There's one man with a vision. Every revolution, he's inspiring mirror Spock to start a revolution. He is not inspiring him to assassinate his captain. Um, And we have one more thread that we're going to pull in because Spock says, the man must also have the power. And that's where we bring in Marlena and the Tantalus field. Well, guess what, Spock? Yeah. (laughs) But do I have a goodie for you? (laughs) And then there's this musical rise and dramatic rise to the final moment of the speech. It's the line you just said. In every revolution, there's one man with a vision. Captain Kirk, I shall consider it. And, and, and there's that last shot on that close up on Kirk, and he gives that that smile of pride. Like, that's my Spock. Yep. Right? And then they beam out again using the alternate transporter effect mm-hmm. uh, created by Van Der Veer uh, visual effects specifically for this episode. And then just like we saw when they went back to the prime universe to show the mirror landing party going into the brig, there's that great edit, right? It's like almost like a Batman edit where instead of just a cut or a swipe, the, the, the edit like flips. It's a flip. It's by the way, it is totally forbidden for all young editors to use these transitions. They're all signs of bad editing but it's fantastic in this it episode. works perfectly yeah. here because you're flipping to the other universe you're Absolutely. not just cutting to another scene you're flipping back to the prime universe and then 
look, as, as the crew is uh, beaming out, as the landing party is beaming out, you see the lighting in the transporter room again is, is more dimly lit. And you see the logos of the uh, Empire, you know, with the sword through the earth uh, in the transporter platform behind them. And then it flips and the lighting is brighter. And you see the traditional transporter effect come on, come through mm-hmm. and they're beaming in. And there's that really, really great music that you heard at the end of uh, the Doomsday Machine. And when they materialize in full and they're looking around, the look of relief yeah. on the faces of the landing party. And by the way, I love the look on Spock and Kyle's faces as the landing party is beaming through. Kyle can't contain his relief and happiness. He is beaming. John Winston's smile is so like uh, 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 infectious, you know, in the way that he is so happy to have his crew back. And if you look, and I and I watched this a couple times. I I rewound it a little bit, uh, and when you the look on Spock's face. He is like a breathing a sigh of relief, and he is about about to launch into a smile before it's it it cuts back to the landing part. Welcome home, Captain. We end up on the bridge, and we ask this question: something we brought up earlier in the episode. What I don't understand is how you were able to identify our counterpart so quickly. It's far easier for you, as civilized men, to behave like barbarians than it was for them as barbarians to behave like civilized men. And that goes back to what what I brought up with Kirk saying, basically thinking to himself, I know exactly what you mean because I had this experience back with uh, the enemy within when I saw my sav itself. I assume they returned to their enterprise at the same time you appeared here. Probably, however, that Jim Kirk will find a few changes if I read my spots correctly. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I really think this is what part of what's so great about this episode is that there's this whole story that gets to live on in our heads of what happened next. Well, what happened next? I was going to say this, but what happened next is really an, a, a, something to really, really ponder. And there has been so much sort of fan retcon about what happened right. in the mirror universe after prime Kirk left and Mira Kirk got back to his universe. What happened after that moment? Well, you can actually see for yourself. There is a really fantastic fan-made Star Trek series called Star Trek Continues. And it is there there are a few of them that are that are really 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 good. Uh like Star Trek Phase 2 is also a, a really, really terrific uh, a fan-made series. Like they really put a lot of love into this with great writing and the costumes and the cinematography using the original effects and sound cues and music mm. cues. But Star Trek continues. There is an episode called, are you ready for this? Fairest of them all. Okay. Okay. Cause you know, episode is mirror, mirror. mirror. Yeah. Sure. So who is the fairest of them all? So, this episode of Star Trek Continues, which is online, it's on YouTube. You can watch it anytime you want, and I strongly recommend that you do. It picks up the moment Prime Landing Party beams mm. off the ISS Enterprise and the Mirror Landing Party beams back. So if you want to have an idea, if you want to see one point of view of what happened in the Mirror Universe from that point forward, this entire episode takes place in the mirror universe, and we actually see what happens to the mirror universe crew of the ISS mm. Enterprise when Spock is inspired by the Prime Kirk to uh, be the captain of this yeah. enterprise. It's called Star Trek Continues. The episode is fairest of them all. It is really fantastic. And Steve, I, you've got to see I'm going to watch it. Yourself. I'm going to watch it. Yeah, it's that sounds great. really great. It's great. Jim, I think I liked him with a beard better. Gave him character. Of course, almost any change would be a distinct improvement. <laughs> and Kirk makes a joke about how easily Spock, you know, fit into that mirror universe. And then Spock's response. Indeed, gentlemen. May I point out that I had an opportunity to observe your counterparts here quite closely. They were brutal, savage, unprincipled, uncivilized, treacherous, in every way, splendid examples of homo sapiens the very flower of humanity. And then there's a pause, there's a beat, and he goes, 
I found them quite refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> it's still great. I, I, so the, you know, we've talked about these kind of jokes at the end of the show. I totally like this one. I think it's funny. I love this one. I'm not sure, but I think we've been insulted. I'm sure. And that could have been the end of the episode right there. Speed off, executive producer yep, Gene totally. Roddenberry. But there is still one more coda to this episode. A blue skirted lieutenant walks on the bridge. She looks really familiar with a different hairstyle. And it is Lieutenant Marlena Moreau. And I love the look on Uhura's face. Yeah. She's, she's like, whoa. And she, Scotty sees her too. There's a Scott, Scotty, Scotty has a reaction too. Um, yeah, I think it's great. And I love the that Kirk doesn't see her quite at first and then sees her. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant. Marlena Moreau. I was just assigned last week. And he's nodding at her. He signs her clipboard. It's that that is a great moment. And Spock says, uh, you recognize her cap? You met her before? And he's like, uh, why, why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> she just seemed nice, likable girl. I think we could become friends. It's possible. Again, it's like we have all these threads and we're dealing with them. And, and this is one where had this been a different show that really did do continuity, this would have been a great storyline. Oh, you know, absolutely. Going it down through a whole season. Um, but of course it's not because that's not the kind of show that it is. Scott, what were people's reactions to Mirror Mirror? Well, well, before I get into that, I just yes. want to point out that this last scene that we're seeing with Kirk and Marlena was actually repurposed for the Deep Space Nine episode, Trials and Tribulations. So this, when that episode aired in 1996 to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Star Trek, and, and I love Trials and Tribulations. Uh, it's such a fun episode. It is fun. And, and so, so what they did using the CGI at the time was they took out Marlena Moreau and they put in Avery Brooks as Captain Sisko. Oh. And he's like saying how much he admires uh, Captain Kirk. And they're, they're using the exact same take of Kirk looking at, at it's, in this case, Sisko, but still having the same reaction he had with Marlena. Hmm. But it works perfectly. And it's such a, it's such a beautiful moment. And, you know, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen Trials and Tribulations. It's really, really a lot of fun. But Steve, to answer your question, Michelle Nichols loves this episode. And she says, I loved any of the episodes in which the various characters were able to interact with one another and advance the storyline at the same time, which is exactly what you've been pointing out all along in this episode, Steve. She says, we were the first ensemble cast and that is absolutely true dorothy fontana said what a great concept we hadn't done anything like that before it was a fun show to do and barbara luna who plays marlena moreau says for being in just one episode i've had five action figures made out of me <laughs> comparatively speaking i don't quite get that mirror mirror is as popular as it is i can only suspect that well Maybe because Leonard Nimoy wore a beard and he looked <laughs> great. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what I, I mean, I think I've already said it. This movie, this, this episode's so good. It's so good top to bottom. All, every single detail is well thought out. I don't think there's a wasted moment. I think you get all, all the characters get to shine. And that doesn't take away from Kirk and Spock having just incredible storylines. And I want to go back to this idea of if we say that these are genetically the exact same people. There was a documentary about the war in Iraq that I saw years ago, and there was a person who had been part of the, had been part of the basically rebels against the Americans. And, and there was an interview with him where it was, you know, kind of grayed out and his voice was distorted, so we yeah. didn't recognize mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. And the thing he said was, he said, because Iraq is the birthplace of honor, that all honor came from Iraq, we have to show the world what the true definition of honor is. And this is a guy who was committing what we would see as terrorist attacks. And the reason I bring it up is that in his mind, what he was doing was honorable. And not only did he believe it was honorable, he believed that his culture invented honor. And I went, oh, all cultures believe that. All cultures believe that the way they do it is the right way. Even went so that, you know, someone who were the Romans as they were, that empire was conquering everywhere. Well, they thought it was because the Romans should, you know, that they were doing what was right. And so does our mirror Kirk. He thinks what he's doing makes sense. 
And that is the big thing to think about for me is like, if we say this is a world filled with evil people, it's not that interesting. But if we say this is a world filled with these people that we love and they're behaving in ways that are evil, well, that's actually a really disturbing idea. And so we get a really fun, exciting, thrilling episode at the heart of which is a really complicated idea. And I think that is why this is clearly one of the great episodes of Star Trek of all time. I, I agree with you 100 percent. And I think what you said was was perfect and beautifully pointed out. And uh, I, I look, I as I said at the top of this episode, I think it is a perfect Star Trek episode from start to finish. The pacing is very fast paced, just like Doomsday Machine. It doesn't really let up. Uh, and when it does let up uh, for the romance, the romance works. It fits perfectly. This episode has action, heart, and humor, and romance. It's an episode that has it all. If this was an episode of Star Trek Discovery, it would have taken 16 episodes to do. But the producers and writers of the original series did it in one episode, and it is it's perfect. I love that speech, that 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 great Kirk speech at the end. And here's another reason why I really suspect that that speech was written by Gene Kuhn, because compare that speech to the speech that Kirk gave at the end of A Taste of Armageddon, which you mm. and I have referred to many, many times yeah. throughout Enterprise incidents. Uh, we're not going to kill today. It was, there's no question in my mind that it was Kuhn who wrote that final monologue. And the other thing like that you pointed out, it's something that I haven't really thought this deeply about, but this being Enterprise Incidents, and after what you just said, I, I completely agree that what makes this episode interesting, on top of all the other ways in which it's just so very, very great, is that what, what we see the mirror universe doing is, is evil. What the mirror universe sees the mirror universe doing is routine and normal yeah. for yep. them. They don't see what they are doing as evil. They are doing their thing. What we see them doing that makes them interesting because they are not judging themselves. They are they are doing what they're doing with, with conviction. Right. Uh, it, it's just like when you say to an actor, uh, how do you play an evil person without judging that character? And the actor will always say, I never judge the character I'm playing. Play that character like that character is convinced that they're doing the right thing. Yep. And I think that's the key to what makes everything that's happening among our heroes in the mirror universe so very, very, very interesting. And I thought that that really this entire podcast episode, Steve, you pointed that out really perfectly, perfectly and summed it up so very well. And it really is amazing how this one episode, Mirror Mirror, influenced so very much in Star Trek for the decades to come to this very day. First of all, you had the Deep Space Nine episode crossover, plus four more episodes of Deep Space Nine, which were inspired by the events of Mirror Mirror. Then you have the terrific, the really terrific two-part episode of Star Trek Enterprise, called In a Mirror Darkly, parts one and two, which was actually a prequel to Mirror Mirror, but mm. a sequel to the Tholian web. Try wrapping your head around that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's season one's uh, discovery arc, starting with context as for kings. But again, like I mentioned, uh, there's been so much fan fiction. There have been so many comic books and novels written about the mirror universe, the counterparts, you know, there's even a mirror universe uh, version of the next generation crew in one of the books, uh, which is really great. But I would say that if you're going to seek out like something else that wasn't Canon, like those deep face nine and enterprise episodes, again, I strongly recommend this uh, star Trek continues episode that's on YouTube. It's really, really fantastic as are all of those episodes. Uh, there's, I think 11 of them. Hmm. Um, but, uh, it's really great. And this episode, Steve, I mean, I was so excited to, to do our deep dive, but I remember when we first started doing enterprise incidents, it felt like it was so far away. And again, what a perfect way for us to mark the midpoint the halfway point of Enterprise Incidents than with one of the very best episodes of Star Trek. And I will say, after this conversation, one of my very favorite conversations we have had so far on Enterprise Incidents. 
I 100% agree. And since we obviously had a lot to say about this episode, <laughs> it might very well be our lo the longest episode of Enterprise Incidents. My guess is that you all have a lot to say, and we would love to hear your thoughts on Facebook. You can do a search for Enterprise Incidents. Maybe you prefer to interact on Twitter, search for Enter Incidents, or on Instagram, Enterprise Incidents. You can also subscribe to the show on YouTube, where you can leave your comments on this episode. We love interacting with you there. Also, you could subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Please leave your reviews there or on Stitcher or on Spotify where you can rate the show. And if you want to reach me, you can do it at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. If you're interested in movies, you know, this is an episode where the crew of the Enterprise enter into a strange and bizarre world where there are a bunch of films we've talked about on the cinephiles where people enter strange worlds like the original Planet of the Apes from 1969. Beauty and the Beast, suddenly we're in the world where all these things have come to life. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, The Matrix, Jurassic Park has dinosaurs all of a sudden, and maybe some of the strangest worlds you could possibly enter are the worlds of dreams that you might find in Christopher Nolan's Inception. And Scott, don't forget, we, don't forget, yeah. Steve, we're talking about the Empire. And of course, you and Steve on the Cinephiles covered Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. That's 100% true. Uh, Scott, <laughs> if people wanted to find you on the interwebs, how would they do that? Okay, you can check me out on Twitter and Instagram at MovieMance. And for everyone listening to Enterprise Incidents, whether you are on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts, or you're listening to the audio version on YouTube, Please help us get the word out about Enterprise Incidents by sharing Enterprise Incidents with as many Star Trek fans as you can, whether they are casual fans or diehard fans, whether their favorite Star Trek series is Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Lower Decks, or of course the original series. Please help us spread the word about Enterprise Incidents. Share with as many people as possible. Please make sure you review, please review us on Apple Podcasts. Those reviews really help us stand out. And we are very, very grateful that after 200 reviews on Apple Podcasts, we have a perfect score of five out of five. And that is thanks to you so very, very much for your support of Enterprise Incidents. I could not be happier after 40 episodes of this series. The joy of doing this series with Steve Morris, who does such a absolutely superb job cutting and editing the series together. I am supremely grateful. This is one of the most, uh, definitely one of the most uh, rewarding, creative highlights of my entire life, of my entire career. And we are going to keep it going with the very next episode of Enterprise Incidents, an episode I have always liked a lot. And I can't wait to get into this deep dive conversation with Steve on the deadly years the deadly years is next on enterprise incidents so until then keep going boldly boldly